Uh, dear colleagues uh, and friends, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, it seems that we have participants uh, from four countries, uh, Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, Kazakhstan and India and UK also <laughs> from five countries. Um, and uh, today we are going to discuss uh, some important uh, issue, important issue for all uh, stakeholders of science uh, communication, uh, for editors, uh, for uh, authors, for reviewers, uh, such as plagiarism uh, and also how to write and edit uh, English uh, articles, uh, how to write uh, systematic reviews for biomedical journals, uh, and uh, also uh, we, uh, I am very um, proud uh, to introduce uh, our today's uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Armen Gasparian, uh, Dr. Uh, Latika Gupta, and Dr. Durga Misra, who are regular contributors uh, to uh, our uh, webinars, uh, who all uh, are leading uh, journal uh, editors, uh, authors, and reviewers. Uh, and also today we have uh, a new uh, speaker, uh, Srećko Gajovic, uh, who is uh, a former uh, editor of uh, flagship um, Eastern Europe uh, medical journals, uh, such as Croatian uh, Medical uh, Journal. Um, well, uh, and our first speaker, uh, Dr. Arman Gasparian, uh, who is going uh, to uh, discuss uh, some issue of uh, plagiarism. Dr. Arman, you can share with us your uh, screen with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll please enable sharing my screen. Uh, yes, one moment. Yes, now you can do this. Wait a second. Yeah, I see. Uh, yes, I can see your uh, screen, yes. And I would like to stop video uh, as a participants for recording, okay? Our, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I, I see slight noise from somewhere, tickling or something. Uh, one moment, I should uh, check uh, this. Uh, um. I think that every uh, body is on mute except me. <laughs> okay. You can yeah. start your presentation. Good. So, dear colleagues and friends, thank you very much for uh, attending today's uh, webinar. It's an important meeting for Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and uh, it's an important meeting for a newly launched Editors Association, Ukrainian Council of Science Editors. Uh, and today we have a number of participants from different countries. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude, first of all, to our Bulgarian clinicians who are very busy in their uh, COVID-19 clinics, but they, they have managed, managed to register and attend this meeting. Also, my gratitude uh, goes to our Kazakh Kazakhstani uh, authors, uh, fellows from uh, Ukraine, from different cities of Ukraine, and uh, our speakers from India, Croatia. Uh, you probably know that today we have a guest speaker from uh, Croatia, Srećko Gajovic, who is a uh, past editor-in-chief of Croatian Medical Journal, and he is one of the main supporters of Ukrainian authors. Uh, he was very uh, friendly to uh, Ukrainian and Eastern European authors when in, in his, in, during his term as editor-in-chief. And uh, I also had chance to uh, uh, cooperate with Srećko Gajovic to revise guidelines of his journal, Croatian Medical Journal, and learn a lot about problems in Central and Eastern Europe in the field of uh, science editing. Today, we are going to discuss plagiarism, uh, which is uh, 
one of the main issues in the field of uh, ethical writing, editing, and publishing. So uh, we'll discuss uh, issues related to causes of plagiarism, where it uh, can be detected and how to eradicate or how to detect and prevent plagiarism. So uh, there are a number of editorial associations dealing with um, plagiarism or uh, copying, unethical writing, unethical editing. So not just authors uh, are responsible for unethical writing and uh, research misconduct, but also other uh, lay, uh, uh, other um, stakeholders of scholarly publishers publishing are responsible for mistakes, errors. So we should uh, list some of the important associations. These are associations are important for authors, research managers, journal editors and publishers. So first of all, Committee on Publication Ethics, it's uh, an editorial association with more than 12,000 members. I strongly encourage Eastern European journal editors to join this association. Uh, it's quite uh, difficult to join this association because uh, managers of Committee on Publication Ethics, takes in, uh, uh, they take into account a number of factors for accepting membership, including uh, ethical issues, um, distancing from predatory publishing and a number of other eth ethical issues. Another important association is Office of Research Integrity, quite a serious association uh, describing and um, dealing with plagiarism primarily in Americas. And of course, Council of Science Editors it's again a, a US-based association. Uh, they, uh, editors of um, Council of Science Editors, represent New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, BMJ, other top uh, international medical journals, and their recommendations uh, are uh, important and uh, are a valuable source for authors, reviewers, and editors. So today we are going to discuss plagiarism and uh, today's discussion is important for all authors uh, who are going to do their research, online research, uh, process literature sources, and they should do it ethically and they should know how to refer to scientific facts, how to paraphrase, how to uh, provide references for each scientific statement. So definition of plagiarism comes from different editorial associations. I refer to Council of Science Editors as a definition. They consider it as a form of piracy that involves the use of different uh, items, figures, graphics, uh, texts, uh, without proper acknowledgement and without permission from primary uh, publisher or primary proprietor of ideas, texts, graphics. So uh, from, um, from the point of view of editors, it's important to know that uh, plagiarism not is not it's not confined to textual plagiarism there are different a variety of forms of plagiarism and it may involve plagiarism or copying graphics different types of graphics videos uh, x-ray films and also ideas so if Textual plagiarism is relatively easy to detect, particularly in the era of open access. Plagiarism of ideas, more sophisticated, more concealed, and um, uh, it's more uh, a type of plagiarism prevalent in uh, developed countries, whereas in developing countries, textual plagiarism or so-called verbatim copying of texts more uh, 
prevalent. So we should know as authors and editors that plagiarism uh, refers to copying ideas, graphics, and texts. And uh, by uh, uh, referring to different types of plagiarism, I, I'd like to share uh, my, uh, my and uh, Dr. Olena Zimba's recently accepted uh, for publication uh, article specifically dealing with plagiarism. So there are uh, different types of uh, classification of plagiarism includes copying of ideas, word for word copying, paraphrasing plagiarism or paraphrasurism, text recycling or self-plagiarism when someone copies uh, his or her own text, previously published text, Translational, translational plagiarism, which is more common in Slavic countries, Eastern European countries, when uh, novice, inexperienced authors publish something in, let's say, Slavic language or other languages, and then in, in their local journals, then translate and submit to another more prestigious, higher rank journal and publish in English. So this type of plagiarism is more prevalent in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, because of some reasons. So I am not going to uh, delve deeper into causes of uh, translational plagiarism, but you simply should know that uh, all your uh, Ukrainian or uh, um, local uh, papers can be translated and submitted to another journal, English journal. So you should, as editors, you should be very careful. So uh, there is also uh, a form of uh, plagiarism related to graphics, different types of graphics, uh, more difficult to detect compared to textual plagiarism, but still possible, particularly because of, uh, because of the availability of different computer software. Plagiarisms with citation manipulation. So it's again something new for most participants of today's uh, webinar, but you should know that if you publish, uh, let's say introduction, and the whole introduction refers to just one reference, it's incorrect, it's wrong. You should carefully read the whole introduction of your article and try to link each scientific statement, each scientific fact with proper reference. However, if you copy large parts of ch large chunks of text from another source and simply add irrelevant references just to uh, mislead readers, it's intentional serious form of plagiarism. So be very careful. If you copy uh, texts, without enclosing in quotation marks, simply providing reference uh, to irrelevant source, it's incorrect, it's intentional plagiarism. Try to link all scientific facts, uh, all quotations, st qu quoted statements to proper references. And there is also compound plagiarism when in one article, uh, we see different types of verbatim copying, uh, uh, copy, uh, recycling, text recycling or self-plagiarism and graphics plagiarism. I know that uh, most of Indian authors uh, like to uh, reuse graphics for review articles. It's Okay, it's uh, acceptable, provided they uh, refer to written permission. However, if in one article, in one review, there are a number of copied graphics, tables, it's also considered something odd, something unacceptable from the point of view of redundancy. So if your review article includes a number of uh, recycled graphics, graphics, it's, in, it's inappropriate and 
author should simply draw authentic or uh, original graphics to avoid claims of uh, plagiarism. So all our participants probably know that we need bibliographic databases for searches of uh, reliable information, for uh, finding scientific directions for our research, new directions, and to evaluate or map our own scientific research field. Here I present plagiarism as a research topic and use Scopus database for searches, for so-called comprehensive searches, because we know that Scopus is one of the largest bibliographic databases. It uh, covers 100% of Medline indexed articles and 100% uh, uh, of Embase, Excerpta Medica indexed items. But the problem is that not all Medline index and PubMed uh, covered articles are immediately accepted for Scopus coverage. So we always recommend our authors, particularly those who write review articles to combine Scopus searches with Medline or PubMed searches. So here I presented examples of comprehensive searches. Uh, when I use plagiarism as a single keyword, I retrieve more than 7,000 articles tagged with this keyword. Uh, but when I narrow my searches uh, through Scopus and include second keyword publishing because plagiarism primarily refers, relates to publishing. So I uh, retrieve just 2,000 articles tagged with plagiarism and publishing. So, and I can also uh, rank all articles uh, using um, certain options in uh, Scopus and rank all articles uh, in line with their citation numbers. And I can also analyze top 100 cited articles or for this uh, presentation, I, I used just five, 10 top cited articles and analyzed uh, um, most relevant sources. So uh, Scopus allows me to uh, visualize annual publication activity in the field of plagiarism and publishing. And I see that initial publications related to both keywords were published in 1947 and the number of articles increased starting uh, from 1989, reached its peak in uh, 2000s. And the trend is that articles in this field are increasing. So the uh, importance of plagiarism is growing. It's a relatively influential research Field. I also should pay attention where authors publish. They primarily publish in nature, science and engineering ethics, science, and many other top scientific journals. So nature published so far 86 articles and most of these articles are highly cited, influential, and they cover important aspects of plagiarism. Uh, pay also attention to countries interested in the field of plagiarism. Of course, US, UK, India are top three countries interested in plagiarism uh, as a research topic. Unfortunately, Eastern European and Central Asian authors are not as active as their uh, uh, counterparts, their colleagues from uh, US and UK. So they should pay more attention to plagiarism because uh, they probably know that uh, plagiarism, copying and uh, research misconduct, misconduct is 
widespread in Eastern European and Central European, Central uh, Asian countries. Uh, they, uh, please also uh, draw your attention to a um, pie chart suggesting that not just medicine, but also sociology, computer science are also main areas where plagiarism is a priority research topic. So only one third of uh, articles in, in the field of plagiarism and publishing refer to medical science. So there are also, so plagiarism is multidisciplinary issue. By using Scopus, we may uh, analyze keywords related to plagiarism and publishing. And we can also calculate percentages of uh, keywords frequently used in connection with plagiarism and publishing. Here I presented some of uh, keywords that in my mind are important uh, uh, in terms of plagiarism, scientific misconduct, ethics, periodicals as topic, these are mesh keywords. Authorship also relates to plagiarism. Questionary, plagiarism is explored mostly in survey studies. So we also uh, conducted survey study a few weeks ago and I'll discuss results of our survey a bit later. Uh, also pay attention to retraction as a publication, as a research, as a topic also refers to plagiarism and also many other keywords uh, to comprehensively cover importance of all these uh, keywords. We may use uh, computer software bubble software to visualize the most important keywords, uh, highly uh, frequently used keywords in connection with plagiarism. But even without using uh, software, we may pay attention uh, to keywords eyeball by using so-called eyeballing technique and manually uh, select keywords mostly used or mostly tagged in articles covering plagiarism. Miguel Roig is one of the leading authors, one of the 10 leading or top authors publishing in the field of plagiarism. Any research, any author who deals with research uh, topic, with any research topic, should be interested who frequently covers, who frequently publishes in his or her research topic. In connection with plagiarism, I refer to Miguel Roig. He published just 10 articles on plagiarism, but most of these articles published by uh, science, by leading uh, general medical and specialist journals, and I also learned a lot from Miguel Ruiz. His profile, profile on Scopus may be not so impressive for uh, research managers or bibliometricians who are obsessed with citations, with uh, numbers, because he, Hirsch index of this American psychologist expert in plagiarism is just 12. However, most of his publications refer to plagiarism, explain different types of plagiarism and his definition of plagiarism related to images, texts and graphics is the most comprehensive definition and the most appropriate definition of plagiarism. Uh, of top 10 top articles are uh, selected. I selected this one published by Proceedings of the US uh, Academy of Sciences. And I found, I refer to this uh, important uh, source where plagiarism 
uh, is detected in 10% in roughly 10% of articles, medical articles retracted and uh, uh, represented on PubMed platform. We may use different platforms to analyze retractions, plagiarism. I usually refer to PubMed and uh, there is also another new platform. I, I'll discuss the, this platform, a retraction uh, platform. So, but uh, so far we know that 10% of retracted articles in the field of medicine are due to plagiarism. So which countries usually contribute to plagiarism? Interestingly, US, Germany, Japan, China uh, contribute to three fourths of retracted articles. And uh, th uh, these uh, articles are retract retractions due to plagiarism are due to a variety of reasons not just textual plagiarism, but also plagiarism of ideas, uh, uh, intentional or unintentional plagiarism. Uh, when I analyze this highly cited article in the field of plagiarism with more than 500 citations covered by dimensions uh, in uh, this is an uh, impressive uh, number of citation, citations. And I also pay attention to Altmetrics at, uh, Attention Score or AAS. And again, it's these donut, A -A, um, Altmetrics donut, again, impressive, more than 1,000 points score for uh, mainly due to coverage of this journal, this article by news outlets, blogs, these sources usually boost uh, social media profile of article. So it's um, uh, this example of highly cited article dealing with retractions and plagiarism is quite exemplary. What is important here is that Ukrainians or Central European scientists are not interested or not covered this article in their social media platforms or accounts. And the same refers to Central Asian scientists. You see gray arrays and you see dark blue um, field on this map suggestive that American US scientists are actively uh, or they actively discuss this important article on social media. So we should pay attention, not just citations, but also to social media metrics. So, and this article is quite important uh, from both points of view, citations and social media. Some examples of uh, apparent or blatant plagiarism from Europe, unfortunately from Croatia. And you see an example of uh, scientists, leading scientists, former uh, chancellor of Zagreb Med uh, University Medical School and uh, his wife, who a lady who plagiarized the whole anatomy textbook copied uh, the whole book, uh, American or US anatomy textbook and published in Croatian language. Of course, students immediately detected that copying and reported. Uh, the lady uh, apologized for oversight because she was editor of that textbook, anatomy textbook published in Croatian and uh, apologized for oversight. All these chapters were copied, the whole from US textbook. And unfortunately, uh, editors didn't pay attention to 
apparent plagiarism. So uh, that book, textbook, was published with uh, copying uh, of images and texts. There are also a number of retractions from Croatia, exemplary retractions due to, including due to plagiarism. But the, uh, the point is that Croatians transparently retracted and explained reasons for retractions due to plagiarism. So you see a number of retractions in PubMed, we have 14 retractions from Croatia and some of these retractions are due to plagiarism, simple or verbatim copying by inexperienced authors who uh, apologized for their, their mistakes. And it's acceptable if it's unintentional and if editors retract and explain reason without uh, keeping uh, that article, uh, copied article or plagiarized article, it's acceptable. So retraction and transparent uh, explanation is acceptable. Here are examples of retractions from Croatia and explanation. Here you see uh, an apology of Croatian scientists who copied published article in Croatian medical journal, editors retracted that article and asked that corresponding author to apologize. So Christian Desha apologized without any sanctions, without any punishments, uh, harsh punishment. So it's acceptable because it's, because it's clear that uh, the author is inexperienced. Uh, that author wasn't, wasn't aware what constitutes plagiarism and hopefully uh, he or she didn't uh, uh, hadn't committed any other forms of uh, misconduct. Now, we have new tool, a retraction database, and we can use this database. Uh, authors of this database are from US again. This platform is registered with um, ISSN Center as a source of dissemination of scientific information. So database platform also can be registered with ISSN Center. So, and this platform allows us to analyze different types of plagiarism, plagiarism of data, images and text, but uh, it's, uh, there is no entry related to plagiarism of ideas. So plagiarism of ideas quite difficult to detect and retract related articles. We see one entry from Ukraine in the field of mathematics, Journal of Mathematical Sciences retracted. This retraction not visible on PubMed, visible only on the retraction database. And uh, so we should combine PubMed with retraction database searches for plagiarized retracted item to have complete or comprehensive picture of plagiarism. We conducted our own survey and I'd like to use this opportunity to thank, first of all, Latika Gupta who provided uh, access to SurveyMonkey, Dr. Olena Zimba, other colleagues from different countries, primarily from Croatia, from Bulgaria, from Ukraine, Kazakhstan, India, you see that number of respondents from India, 50 is the most. 24% of participants were from India. So we may use this survey as a valuable and new report on uh, different uh, reasons, different uh, sources of plagiarism. Uh, respondents of this plagiarism uh, survey were mainly clinicians, educators, and researchers. Uh, they pointed they they pointed to education as the main or inappropriate education as main source of plagiarism. So 
please educate medical students how to avoid plagiarism, how to write articles. Also, uh, when we analyzed uh, what type of plagiarism is witnessed by our respondents, they refer to different types of, they confessed that different types of uh, plagiarism is prevalent in their environment. It can be translational plagiarism, verbatim copying, paraphrasurism, self-copying, self-recycling, text recycling, copying of graphic graphics, stealing of ideas. Ideas are usually are usually stolen by reviewers. So try to involve only ethical reviewers for uh, evaluation of valuable works and try to limit duration of peer review to avoid plagiarism of ideas. We also uh, questioned our respondents uh, about which type of uh, copying or plagiarism is acceptable. So most of them consider different types of copying acceptable, but uh, only 22% of respondents claimed, uh, stated that none of copying is acceptable even when clinicians copy definitions of diseases, when they explain methodology, they should try to use different language. They should paraphrase. They should be good in English. Uh, they should be skilled, experienced to properly uh, explain uh, everything in their own words. How to detect? plagiarism. They claimed, they uh, noted that Google Scholar and Identicate are mostly used to uh, detect plagiarism. And of course, in my opinion as well, Identicate is one of the leading software most uh, widely used globally for uh, detection and prevention of plagiarism. how to detect plagiarism. Of course, editors should use Identicate if they deal with English texts, main texts. But other software also acceptable if you use with uh, non-English texts. What's the role of social media in terms of plagiarism? Social media channels of different journals can be used to discuss detected uh, uh, plagiarism, plagiarism detected by readers. So our social media editors should be very careful with uh, what they promote and journal editors should also have in place editorial strategies to avoid plagiarism, uh, use different software and to have good reviewers who may spot and report plagiarism. When we asked our respondents about uh, plagiarism, whether they committed plagiarism, most of them, of course, more, more than 80% confessed, uh, claimed that they ha hadn't committed plagiarism, but 18% confessed at some stage of their career, they copied, they uh, committed plagiarism. So probably unintentional. So it's good. It's a reliable source of information about plagiarism. I also would like to refer to one of um, Iranian authors, Iranian editors who uh, examined plagiarism in Iranian articles and uh, in uh, one of his articles, he analyzed copying of um, co copying or plagi uh, plagiarism by Iranian authors, urologists who published in urology journals, and he detected 
that uh, half of articles in his own journal, urology journal, contained at least one copied sentence. So be very careful. Editors should pay attention to copied parts. When they use authenticate, they should manually recheck which parts contain copying and they should ask authors to paraphrase or omit, delete copied sections. So uh, Iranians nowadays are transparent in terms of plagiarism and they punished their authors, reviewers and editors for intentional plagiarism. Uh, Farhat Faroqi, who is now uh, an American-based scientist who emigrated uh, a while ago, he's uh, originally Iranian editor, uh, expert in plagiarism. He, I quote his uh, statement that using state sentences of others and just changing words here and there is an example, is still an example of plagiarism, even if we properly cite the reference. So <clears throat> if authors copy chunks of text from other sources and provide reference, it's, uh, it's still plagiarism. They should paraphrase. Types of plagiarism different in different countries. In developing countries, in non-Anglophone countries, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, lack of uh, knowledge, English, uh, inappropriate language skills, usually lead to plagiarism among inexperienced authors. In America, usually academic laziness is source of plagiarism, text pl uh, recycling or self-recycling. Intentional intellectual theft is punishable. And you should know that stealing ideas, stealing methodologies without proper uh, permission is a serious crime, a serious form of plagiarism. Stealing images, intentional stealing of images, graphics, even for lectures, presentations by educators, also considered as plagiarism. Inappropriation, uh, misappropriation of others' ideas without reference, also considered as intentional form of misconduct. Editors, when you see introduction parts or discussion parts in your uh, in sub, uh, manuscripts processed by you, you should ask your authors to Careful, carefully and appropriately link each scientific fact, each scientific statement with appropriate reference and ask them to reaffirm that no part of their articles is copied from elsewhere. Unintentional copying, mostly uh, prevalent among inexperienced authors uh, authors from developing countries or non-anglophone countries from China. In China, copying is rooted in their culture. So be very careful with, when you process submissions from China because they may also copy even quotes of le uh, leading scientists without reference. So when you deal with Chinese submissions, be very careful, ask them to adhere to international ethics norms. To avoid plagiarism in publications, we should adhere to different style guides. And again, I uh, encourage our editors from Central Asia and Eastern Europe to have style guides primarily from Psychological Association of America, because we mo mostly use their style guide. And we refer to their statements, how to avoid copying. Self-plagiarism, how to avoid self-plagiarism when leading authors 
write review articles, and they, if they are limited in time, they should ask someone to help, and they should carefully uh, monitor the whole process of writing. It's unacceptable to copy previously published texts, even if you are author of these texts. Again, you should uh, use new language, you should paraphrase and avoid plagiarism. Sometimes salami or augmented publications are also considered as self-plagiarism. You know probably salami publication when uh, you have a, a large uh, data, big data, and you divide that, uh, the data into several small parts and publish each part separately. It's considered a salami. And the opposite is augmented publication. When PhD candidates publish 10 articles and then decide to publish just one article to convince uh, their research managers uh, that uh, they have one article, solo authored article, that's considered as augmented article if that article, final article, uh, have, uh, contains a lot of copied materials from previously published texts. Are there any limits of plagiarism? Of course, no. There are no any limits. Zero plagiarism is, zero percent of plagiarism is accepted as norm. Of course, there are some publications that are considering uh, different percentages of similarity, acceptable, unacceptable, let's say 30% is unacceptable. But again, uh, the most acceptable limit is zero limit, no any trace of plagiarism. How we detect plagiarism? Different types of detection, Google search, whistleblowing, plagiarism detection software, let's say, uh, there uh, were many examples of plagiarism in Lancet detected by whistleblowers who contacted chief editor of Lancet and informed them that uh, article published in leading scientific journal contained copied materials, copied data, not just text, text, text but also data. We have Google images to uh, uh, detect uh, copied images. But we should know about strategy, how we detect, de uh, how we uh, spot or detect plagiarism. We may detect copied parts of text, it's easy. We may use, uh, we may compare text uh, keywords in different matched uh, texts and see whether keywords are similar and then delve deeper and consider whether there are textual uh, uh, copies. Writing styles. If we see in an article different writing styles, American and British, we may suspect plagiarism and may ask authors to pay attention to different styles, paraphrase and avoid plagiarism. Methodologies. If we see a method section without any reference, we may suspect again plagiarism. References, it's an old trick. When we see references in different articles, different dissertation, dissertations, PhD dissertations, similar to each other, we may suspect plagiarism, even if uh, texts are different. Hypothesis, the best way to avoid uh, copying or plagiarism claims is to reference each uh, scientific fact. And of course, visualize uh, graphics plagiarism, again, uh, difficult to detect because of some reasons, because of image manip manipulation, but still possible, particularly with use of Google images and other software. Uh, we may also use PubMed and other platforms to detect similar articles. So now we have connected paper and uh, I'm not aware, but probably there are other software to detect similar articles. 
an example from Eastern Europe and an example of uh, unethical behavior of editing agency that copied a Russian article and sold this article to Chinese scientists who published that article in PubMed Central Journal, Pakistan Journal of Medical Sciences. I was contacted by authors, author who uh, complained of copying her article. And we discussed this article. There was copying of graphics and manipulation of tables. And we detected that. But Identicate missed copying because Identicate detected only 2% of copying. And when I asked chief editor of that Pakistani journal how he uh, published that article, he simply responded that there was no any copying. It was just 2% of copying, acceptable level of plagiarism. It's compound form of plagiarism. Of course, we explained to chief editor and that article was retracted after discussions, after contacting, even after contacting to uh, Committee on Publication Ethics. So Crossref nowadays provides powerful anti-plagiarism tool, Authenticate. So it's possible to detect and Authenticate is the best platform, best software because it uh, aggregates information from more than 50,000 pub, uh, members, publishers, standalone journals. So it's mainly, it's only for English journals or journals publishing English texts. So that's, uh, here is a, an example of startup journal, one of the promising journals uh, from Central Asia. And this journal publishes English texts, texts and all these texts uh, are checked by Crossref Identicate, similarity check. And I'll present the, these examples. Try uh, also to use Identicate if you are going to publish English texts. So how we uh, uh, deal with Identicate? We simply report overall similarity percentage, 6%, it's low. Here is example of Srechko Gajovic text uh, article manuscript, which I checked. And there was just 6% percent overall copying, overall similarity. However, there was 2% from single source. And when I delve deeper into uh, the manuscript, into text, I found verbatim copying of something that was quote, enclosed in quotation marks. So you see, this highlighted part copy is copied, but it's ethically copied because it's a quotation, word by, uh, by word quotation with quotation marks and reference to proper reference. It's acceptable. So this type of uh, experimenting with Identicate is a, an example. So I am very proud of my association with uh, past association with Croatian Medical Journal. I was a science communication uh, section editor for, uh, for two years under the auspices, uh, under the leadership of Srećko Gajovic, and we managed to revise their instructions for authors. And our uh, approach to uh, plagiarism was strict. So we uh, decided to check all articles by uh, Identicate software, then ask research integrity editor to manually check reports and report or retract articles, published articles in line with Co uh, Committee on Publication Ethics flowcharts. So authors should also know how editors detect and retract articles. Good example for editors, Lancet Journal uh, routinely checks all article, review articles, primarily review articles. They publish seminar series 
and they employ authenticate uh, software primarily to uh, evaluate review articles be because most review articles, even by leading authors, may contain copied parts, text recycling, graphics recycling, recycling, etc. Unfortunately, authenticate uh, uh, do not allow authenticate software does not allow to uh, check for copied graphics, but editors may manually check whether uh, graphics included in uh, review articles available uh, in Google uh, via Google searches. Uh, new or uh, non-anglophone journals, journals from developing countries in Pakistan may use different approaches. Here is an example, uh, two examples from Journal of Pakistan Medical Association. You see that author published something and uh, they disclose that abstract of this article is published as a Congress abstract elsewhere. And they provide link or bibliographic information about abstract. That, that's acceptable. This is acceptable. Another example, disclosure. So review author was asked to disclose or take responsibility for integrity of article. And you see that no part of article contains copied parts. So it's an ethical disclosure, acceptable. Uh, another example of good journal, you see that uh, good journals have research integrity editors and it's a Biochemia Medica journal, good journal from Croatia, again, Croatia. Why Croatia? Because uh, Croatia joined, joined EU in 2013 and they passed long way towards ethical publishing, uh, transparency, and most Croatian medical journals are up to high ethical standards. So uh, I took part in a revision of their instructions for authors uh, in the time of uh, Anna Maria Shimunjic's uh, leadership and again, you see that they use software to track to detect plagiarism. Another, yet another example of good journal. You see new uh, approach in Eastern Europe. I'm sure it's a uh, uh, one of journal, one, a good example, but unfortunately there are not many uh, of uh, such journals. So good journal, Medical Sciences published uh, in Lviv by uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society. And they also have research integrity editor, Andriy Vergun. Hopefully this guy is also attending today's webinar. So you see that these type of journals adhere to best standards. Uh, another example, so a journal from, again, from Ukraine, rheumatology journal, trying to adhere to best standards and they use Grammarly to check for uh, plagiarism. So you see this journal uh, has a statement uh, on plagiarism and no any statement on per, uh, percentage of copying. However, another journal, emerging scientific journal, uses percentage so plagiarism extend more than 20% is unacceptable. So, which means that less than 20% acceptable. So editors should revise this statement and they should uh, note, they should state that 0% percentage of similarity is acceptable. 0% of copying is acceptable. How to avoid plagiarism, simple. Uh, try to avoid copying uh, printed sources. When write, try to use your own words, even if your English uh, not so good, try to involve someone with better uh, language, better uh, skills 
to revise your article. And there are also five simple steps. Don't copy word uh, for word, write in your own words and in your own style. Do not copy American or British styles. Avoid uh, paraphrasing, uh, copying and then paraphrasing here and there. When in doubt, provide relevant reference, particularly for introduction and discussion sections of your article. And in, uh, throughout your review articles, do not recycle graphics, even with permission. Try to draw uh, graphics uh, with, without any copying. Uh, use uh, or publish authentic graphics. And if you think that you, uh, you are urged to copy table graphics, try to, uh, uh, not try, you are obliged to obtain written permission from primary publisher to reuse graphics. And again, I refer to Miguel Roig, leading expert in uh, plagiarism. Uh, and I quote his statement, always acknowledge contributions of others, source of his and her ideas, any verbatim text taken from another author must be enclosed in quotation marks. So that's <clears throat> the last slide of our presentation. Now I am open to quick question, questions and we'll have also a separate Q&A uh, part at the end to discuss plagiarism and other issues. Idea. Hopefully uh, Latika Gupta will continue, will continue <laughs> to uh, discussing uh, language issues in relation to plagiarism. Uh, she's our next speaker. Yep, over to you, Olina. Uh, yes. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, let's uh, hope that knowledge gained uh, during uh, this presentation will help our participants uh, to uh, recognize uh, and avoid uh, plagiarism. Uh, we encourage our participants uh, to ask uh, questions. Uh, you can simply uh, type them uh, into a chat box on your Zoom panel. Uh, and I have one question uh, to Arman regarding to plagiarism. Uh, is it possible to recognize uh, plagiarism uh, in case if article was published uh, in, uh, for example, Ukrainian? Yes, firstly, and then uh, translated uh, into English. Uh, how to recognize this kind okay. of plagiarism? Thank you. So thank you, Olena. It's a difficult issue. Uh, unfortunately, not easy to detect Translate, uh, translated plagiarism in articles, in English articles. Uh, it's a, an, a matter of education. So Eastern European, Polish, Ukrainian, Czech, Hungarian authors should be skilled to write articles in good English and they should be warned to avoid publishing the same article uh, published initially in their own in mother tongue and then translated in English. So I know that Kazakhstani authors, some Kazakhstani authors published in, uh, in their mother tongue locally, and then the same article translated and submitted to top scientific article. It was published and without any trace of plagiarism because uh, primary published primary journal was not digitized was not available and even if it is available uh, as open source it's in uh, Russian not in English so it's difficult to detect it's a big issue mainly we may detect translation plagiarism by whistle blowing by someone reporting to chief editor uh, about copying uh, thank you, Arman. And we have one more question uh, from uh, Professor Zajkivska. Um, uh, no, first of all, thanks uh, for lecture. Uh, what is your recommendation about the manuscript, uh, which uh, manuscripts which weigh on preprint and uh, will not accept it by uh, editorials of journals? Uh, what is the roadmap of them? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. So we also, as editors, deal with preprints and our detection uh, system uh, immediately de detects duplication. So initially a, a manuscript is posted somewhere as preprint on preprint server. And uh, then the same uh, manuscript is submitted for publication to a good journal. We still may publish that article without para, uh, with, with duplication simply author should add note that initial version of these manuscript was posted or archived somewhere uh, as a preprint. The same refers to PhD dissertation. If PhD candidate publishes, uh, archives PhD dissertation somewhere and then uh, uses parts of dissertation for publication as an article, uh, author, that PhD candidate should add note that uh, material was, was initially presented as PhD dissertation. Dissertation, uh, PhD dissertation and other thesis are not published materials. These can be posted, archived somewhere and then published as article as a monograph somewhere else, but again, with transparent statement about previous related archiving, posting, or publication uh, the, as, um, arc as archiving. Uh, thank you, Arman. And one more question from, um, uh, from Velikova, from Dr. Velikova, from uh, Bulgaria. Svetlina. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what is the destiny of the retracted papers uh, if they have a small part self uh, plagiarism and up to 10% uh, is self plagiarized? Well, okay, good. Thank you very much. Svetlina Velikova uh, from Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, immunologist and um, well known uh, immunologist who publishes a lot. Thank you for a great point. So if an article is retracted because of self or text recycling, uh, intentional, unintentional, so author may still republish that article if the only problem is with copying small part. So initially retracted because of copying, but then author may delete, may uh, uh, rectify text, and may republish. However, if that article was retracted, not just because of copying, but because of other more sinister form of misconduct, then there is no any chance to republish because most uh, authors, this type of authors are blacklisted. There is blacklist of plagiarists, serial plagiarists and uh, no any chance to republish. Lancet also retracts articles and republish these type of articles because of honest mistake, honest error. But it's only Lancet can do that. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, question from uh, Professor Stoiko. Uh, what about reproducing uh, figures? Uh, uh, yes, uh, from the open access journals, of course, via citation note. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Stoika, uh, President of Ukrainian uh, Council of Science Editors. Thank you for excellent question. Of course, in the era of open access, authors may copy graphics tables from openly available resources. Of course, it's acceptable to copy if there is uh, an icon, Creative Commons uh, icon, CC BY, allowing to reuse with permission from authors, holders of copyrights for lectures, for uh, review articles, primary source, of course, should be uh, mentioned if it is uh, reused, but 
even for review articles, even uh, for review articles, there is no need to reuse uh, graphics, nice pictures, figures from pu other published articles. It's better to draw uh, new figures because otherwise if, you, if authors reuse a number of graphics in one article, I know that many Indian authors usually reuse a number of graphics for this with permission, with acceptable uh, permi permission. But still, if you see review and four or five graphics uh, copied from elsewhere with permission, it's again decreasing novelty of article, unacceptable from uh, editor's point, editorial point of view. Uh, thank you, Arman. And last uh, question, very important question uh, from Christi Christina Nikolaychuk. Uh, if article is based on abstracts, conference abstracts, uh, which were published uh, somewhere, how to avoid plagiarism? Okay, thank you. Uh, Christina, dermatologist from uh, Ivana Frankivsk, if I'm not mistaken. So, okay, good question. If you published uh, abstract of your uh, full paper somewhere as a Congress abstract, you may reuse the whole abstract and uh, republish it. Uh, Authenticate, TB Blast, other, other software will notify editors that abstract is published elsewhere and uh, there is copying. So we may ask authors to provide note that Congress abstract is uh, published elsewhere. And we, we ask to provide full bibliographic database. But even uh, with Congress abstracts, good authors usually spend some time, uh, mm, reframe, uh, change uh, language in their article and even a correct abstract as well. But Copying abstract congress, congress abstracts for uh, transforming abstract into uh, into full uh, paper is acceptable. Uh, thank you, Arman, uh, and it's a man's uh, pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ladika Gupta, who is a regular contributor to our webinars, uh, who is one of the leading uh, Indian rheumatologists, expert in inflammatory myositis, and she is also highly skilled journal editor and author, uh, and she is expert uh, uh, in social media uh, and uh, survey research. Uh, Dr. Latika is uh, going uh, to uh, talk about um, uh, English uh, writing and editing uh, in biomedical journals. Uh, Dr. Latika, please welcome. Thank you, Lena, for the very kind introduction. And uh, as always, it's truly an honor to be here with your lovely audience. And uh, today we will be talking about um, the language issues in scholarly publication. We've dealt with this topic before, but it's such a huge topic in itself that uh, probably we have parsed it down into smaller components. And uh, today we will also see why it is important. So uh, many of you here, uh, either your MD students or um, um, might be pursuing PhD or are done with that. And you know that um, uh, pursuing PhD is not quite like this but uh, more like this. So uh, it can be a painful and uh, exercise where you have toiled hard and uh, brainstormed uh, for years and years together. And uh, you may not be the only stakeholder. There may be uh, intellectual contributions from many others. So uh, when you publish uh, or when you conduct research, then it is not just about uh, being done with it but you also want your uh, dissertation to be read. And more importantly, you want to feel heard and you want it to be understood. And if it is something uh, which carries meaning, which of course is something you'd believe in, you would also want people to act on it. And uh, uh, only then would you feel redeemed and uh, uh, successful at your uh, efforts and uh, the entire exercise. So uh, this will be possible be, uh, only when your ideas are uh, conveyed in the right context. 
and language is uh, one of the very important uh, tools in your armamentarium to convey what you want to say. And oftentimes, uh, it is unfortunate that people from non-English speaking countries uh, can face trouble because of uh, limited uh, experience and limited training in uh, English language, which is now considered the universal language sort. So um, now, uh, focusing on various difficulties which you can encounter as a non-Anglophone research scholar, uh, the common ones which we uh, dealt with before linguistic like grammar punctuation and stylistic but uh, some are more scientific and more logical and easy to uh, address and something we'll touch upon today that is the organizational or textual context so uh, we will go over the different parts of a manuscript as you typically do while writing one the title abstract introduction theme rad uh, flow basically and then look at the art of photograph uh, paragraphing and organizational context so um, beginning with the title so when we write a research manuscript uh, you'd wonder what title to put and sometimes there are major differences in the way slavic authors uh, draft their titles versus conventional uh, english speaking native english speaking authors so uh, the ground rules that you need it to be attractive uh, because a person should probably try to read it. And that is the uh, portal of entry uh, of a reader into your abstract and eventually into your manuscript. So no one is really going to read the abstract straight away, but uh, they're going to first dive into the title. And uh, sometimes declarative title, like you reveal part of the results that may be enticing. Uh, especially if it is something uh, on a controversial topic or it is challenging common notions, then sometimes declarative titles can help. Then the common rules that is it has to be search engine friendly and of a global readership. So if you just say we research this in Ukraine, then people sometimes, you know, it may carry less relevance, but in the title, if it is non-declarative in this aspect, then sometimes it increases its readership. And then the ideal length, which I'm sure all of you are aware about, and sometimes you add a colon and then address the study design. So uh, this is a classic example of uh, this chapter have very interesting and long title below chapter number. So obviously uh, those who read titles not always read abstracts. And uh, that is why we need to know how to improve the title to convey the nature and topic of the study. So we go through some examples uh, as part of this learning exercise for uh, so there is this title the effectiveness of aromatherapy treatments on fatigue and relaxation for mothers during the early postpartum period and if we have to revise this title then uh, we can remove the get rid of this so this will abbreviate it and make it more crisp and then Instead of just saying the effectiveness on fatigue, we want to see if it addresses fatigue, it elevates fatigue or decreases fatigue and promotes relaxation of mothers. So four is not correct here, it should be off. So basically we make it concise, declarative and dropping the article the where it is unnecessary and use qualifying words to declare the characteristic uh, or elaborate on it like alleviating or promoting so uh, can uh, add to interest. And in line with the, our previous uh, conversation about uh, the wonderful thought over plagiarism, it is all the more important for all of you to understand this because some of our respondents feel that non-Anglophone researchers may be more prone to uh, uh, plagiarize. And why I talk about that is because sometimes in your uh, quest to find the right words, uh, you may end up picking up words from other articles, uh, which may look like um, paraphrasing or, or sometimes uh, we will talk about collocations in a bit. So there are twin words or word groups or phrases which uh, typically go along in a particular language and it is very difficult to familiarize yourself with them like key variable, clinical characteristic. Like sometimes you may not be familiar if you're new to English and you end up, uh, those are okay to copy, but then if you end up copying larger segments 
uh, knowing we are unknowingly, then that is something which can amount to serious plagiarism. And as a non-Anglophone non researcher, it may be all the more important for you to be um, on your guard all the time. So uh, this is, we've talked about it a lot today about translation uh, pl plagiarism, which is a hot topic for today, but there's also something called back translation plagiarism, just for information. So you can translate, uh, suppose uh, in a, 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 a particular article into suppose English, and then you back translate into Ukrainian. So again, it'll be different and this is another form of translation plagiarism which will not be detected. So we don't want our students to have this uh, any kind of illegitimate textual borrowing. So it's very important to dis distinguish between collocations and longer phrases, which I just talked about. So even if you're borrowing, it should not be more than, you know, uh, a collection of two words or three words. Beyond that, it may get flagged as plagiarism. And this is unintentional plagiarism, which is uh, oftentimes found in manuscripts from young researchers of non-English speaking countries. And then literal translations, it is also very important to um, understand that developing knowledge of these word combinations is notoriously difficult. So don't penalize yourself if you can't, just take it easy and maybe we will resort to other means of learning about this. And uh, Dr. Gasparian did talk about this Russian article, which was picked up by Chinese authors and translated to English and published blatantly. Uh, with the copying of figures and everything else. It was a case report. And since now it is in English, it was very much visible. And unfortunately, with an authenticated check, there was just a 2% similarity index. So it's very important to be aware that these kind of things are not acceptable. And the learning points are we need more antiquated. We're going a little tangential here. But uh, yes, these things are very important. And it's um, essential to be aware of that. Now, uh, after a title, it is also uh, important to know how to structure your abstract. And uh, so the article where uh, I read this, a very interesting the authors found that English conference abstracts have a very different writing style in general from Slavic conference abstracts. So this is uh, more of a like cultural flavor, uh, the way people talk. And I can totally see it because even in Hindi, uh, we go with the same um, biases. So uh, in the introduction, usually the English conference abstracts would try to define problem. And, and uh, they would uh, justify that why they're doing this study indicate the gap in understanding while Slavic conference abstract, they would just justify this as a probable solution to the current problem. So they're not going to like define the problem, they're going to say there's a problem and this is a solution, you know, like shortcut or very fast paced. And then um, there's something called meta discourse that is like discussion around a particular topic, building interest. It's like a form of art, I'd say, or remote, remotely can be called a form of art, like highlight the novelty, like you take your time and, and uh, in a very relaxed manner, you discuss all the aspects of it. While Slavic conference abstracts were more like terse and neutral in their tone, there was no meta discourse, you know, like we did this, that's it. And uh, I think we had a word about meta discourse earlier as well, but uh, it is a range of devices which writers use to explicitly organize their texts, engage readers, and signal their attitudes to both their material and the audience. And uh, we should not underestimate the importance of such phrases and should not underuse them. Uh, Ideally, if you were to indulge in a leisurely meta discourse and uh, any kind of like introduction or anything, it would be like three paragraphs at least of equal length and the meta discourse would highlight the novelty and uh, spatially describe the structure, uh, which will be like, the structure would be uh, initially introduce the idea and then you outline all the key components and then elaborate on each of those points. And if needed, each of those points may be a separate paragraph. So that is, the leisurely way in which it should be done. It is a form of art in itself, but also very logical and easily easy to absorb by um, non-English speaking authors. So something you should definitely uh, try to do. I'd say it is much easier than um, much easier than acquiring the skill of uh, understanding English grammar. And uh, notably, Slavic conference abstracts and papers had a neutral tone, no meta discourse, one large paragraph where everything is just jumbled up. There's no flow, there is no structure, and it is more in a bit to hastily summarize everything. 
So the whole idea is take your time and uh, inject your flavor into the manuscript. And that'll be the difference between a well-written manuscript um, versus that of a non-English speaker who will be more uh, reserved and conservative. So um, if we were to talk about the introduction per se, so usual thing is describing the significance of the problems, first define the problem at length, then describe its importance, what are the theories, and then we come to our objective research question explicitly. Now, um, one problem which I have um, oftentimes noted, especially if you have a collaborative person and you end up writing this manuscript with 10 different people. So I had this thing recently uh, wrote with uh, my uh, colleagues from South India and India, as I said before, is a very diverse country and even English spoken in different parts of India is so very different. Uh, it's a dialect of its own kind and English is in a state of flux. So the average English of a South Indian person is very different. And some of my colleagues, so one was a fellow, one was an assistant professor and I myself from North India or with a mixed kind of language, uh, which belongs to, I think, just nowhere. So, <laughs> so we had this uh, multi-authored work and uh, the manuscript can be just like too many cooks boiled abroad it'll be a mixture and will feel like various languages have been injected there and you don't really want it uh, to be like cacophony, you know, when you read that. So, um, yes, yeah, so you should always be mindful of language should be uniform in one particular style, even if it's a bad style, it should be uniform. And uh, other aspects which are very important are clarity, the writing tone should be explorative. So don't be reserved out here. You uh, need to be very free in what you say, add additional words. Meta discourse is an art, although I would say it takes time to acquire, but maybe read more articles to know, particularly from top journals. And um, non-numerical textual information. So sometimes you can, without giving numbers, you can give a lot of information. You know, like I could say, oh, I'm busy, or I could say, you know, I'm really busy and I'm so sorry, I really need to leave. So, th so this really adds context. So there's this non-numerical textual information, which is uh, more rich in its content and flavor. And, and then of course there are cultural issues sometimes. So of course, perspective on culture, there can be ways to express it, but you may need to like dissect out and understand what are the differences, um, cultural differences in uh, delineating uh, different aspects. And uh, methods, this is a classic, very busy slide. We're not gonna go into each of these, but you're very well aware if you've written a manuscript that the methods you describe the research structure, the study context, where it was conducted, sampling strategy, ethics, units of study, data analysis, all of that. But it is also very important to um, talk about credibility of a study. And sometimes the confidence which you exhibit in your manuscript by use of certain words can really say a lot uh, about how it was done. And this is sometimes where um, people from non-English speaking countries falter just because they don't say it well, it may come across as not really done well. This is what you need to be careful about. And uh, sometimes you can emphasize or use triangulation, like emphasize the same aspect uh, but look at it from a different angle by uh, saying that, yes, we did this and we cross check this by doing this. So that is like triangulation maybe or member checking. And sometimes you need to be very careful in bringing out those aspects, even if language is uh, slightly lagging behind in perfection. And then uh, we usually like uh, clarify the target population. So we take up this example where the authors of a paper said that the objective of the study was to investigate into early adolescence physical knowledge, secondary sexual characteristic, and appropriate contraception for teenagers in primary school in Zambia. So we're talking about teenagers in primary school in Zambia, but this is coming at the end of the sentence. So it's very important to define the subject or, or the target population. So objective of the study was to have a closer look at early adolescence in a primary school in Zambia and investigate their knowledge, physical knowledge, no, knowledge of their physical body. You know, this is this is the right 
way to say it. this is a very abbreviated form which uh, um, almost uh, avoids giving out information and then secondary sexual characteristics it's not characteristic it's uh, characteristics and appropriate contraception so uh, plain reporting by initially identifying the target population always be that shows that you're more confident and more clear so identify the target population, identify its location, and then later specify the knowledge items which are being investigated in the population. It is also important to remove redundancy. So this is may not come naturally to you, and it's totally fine as, in, as an Indian author it doesn't come naturally to me either. But then if you revise the manuscript, so you've written the first draft and then you go over it once, and always do it when you're in a relaxed mind, never in a hurry, and you will start finding it yourself. So for example, the collected samples were immediately frozen at minus 80 degrees in the freezer. So do you see and send something out here frozen in freezer? And we assay the oxytocin level using the assay method of zones. Jones. So, so we're using assay word twice in the same sentence. So the collected samples were immediately frozen in the freezer, immediately stored in the freezer at minus 80 and oxytocin level was assayed using Jones method. So this is the right way to say it. Uh, we avoid ambiguous reporting by removing redundant bits. And this is very much addressable if you go over your manuscript carefully. So no rocket science. And the key is uh, in understanding that everybody makes these mistakes, even English speaking authors, and they revise and critically revise their manuscripts and that's how it works out. So you just need confidence and you will get there eventually. Another uh, very interesting way of uh, talking is uh, typically uh, seen in non-native English speakers and, and uh, writers is nominalization. So whenever you have like two verbs in a sentence, like collection of saliva was performed. So collection and performed. So collection can be collected, right? So this is verb nom nominalization. So saliva was collected is more precise, accurate, and avoid nominalization, which is essentially a faux pas and an unnecessary verb, you know, was performed. So these are nominalizations and once it's just a matter of being aware. Uh, so you see explanation was made or was given, you know, appearance was made. So these are common mistakes where we say was made, was done, is coming up again and again. So it's like an abbreviated vocabulary and you were practicing nominalization. Like most common in most of our manuscripts is like statistical data processing was carried out. So this is something that you can just copy right away and just absorb and, you know, ingrain in your minds and never do this. And uh, if you were assessing bone mineral density, so for the assessment of the degree of bone mineral test, to assess the degree for the assessment is again wrong. Uh, another thing, if you uh, when you come down to results section of your paper, you will find that you will need to either compare or contrast different aspects, and then you may need to use parallel structure in your writing. So parallel construction, for example, um, I think it's easier if we just go with examples. So the mean knowledge score of danger science for patients aged 30 years and above was 3.82 compared with those aged 20 years of low. Off low is clearly wrong, but then mean score for knowledge of danger sign instead of knowledge score, mean score for knowledge among patients aged 30 years and above, whereas that among patients and below was this. So, this is the way uh, you construct parallelism or you compare and contrast. Uh, it involves the use of the same grammatical construction. So you can't have difference in the way the first part of the sentence and the second part of the sentence are constructed. I think this may not be very clear. So I've picked up simpler examples. Like if you're describing three different things, they better be said in the same way when they're set together in the same breath, like the letters, the memos and email all need to be professional and the email, you know, it has to be parallel. Like Ellen likes hiking, the rodeo and to take afternoon naps. 
to this sounds odd right this is not parallel she's like hiking she likes attending the rodeo and taking afternoon naps you know like the rodeo is is what it's a noun and these are all verbs right so this also needs to be converted into a verb form or ellen likes to hike to attend the rodeo and take afternoon naps so here instead of hiking and and take it becomes hike and take so this is parallel structure and improving clarity one very important aspect and which people often end up doing is combining sentences uh to very long sentences which have multiple components and it may be very bothersome for the reader so always try to see if your sentence is too large or are having too many commas too many ands then probably it's best to just break them down like they did here the essential newborn care program is acceptable in the indonesian settings and they have some demand so these are two very unrelated sentences being just clapped together uh, without reason they are um, conveying different messages so it's best to just break them down however some barriers exist so uh, this can be better elaborated because again meta the scores they also face the reality of overcoming so these are things to come with time but uh, splitting into shorter sentences is something you should definitely consider and very doable in your um, in the manuscripts you're writing today. And uh, then the use of correlative conjunctions. So furthermore, not only are the approaches to supporting healthcare workers important, it is also important. So correlative conjunctions are where are like not only, but also, you know, these are pairs which go together. So you correlate one part, uh, whatever the first uh, part of the sentence is talking about with whatever the second part of the sentence is talking about you're stitching them together using these correlative conjunctions so you have to do it right you know not only for this thing important it is also important so you can always sense it if you're intuitive enough that why is the same word coming up again that should give you a clue that okay something is wrong here i'm missing something so it is important not only to identify but also to empower women and uh, to be treated respectfully. So uh, not only, but also to denote, also denotes parallelism. And uh, the other thing, uh, which I'm sure many of you would already know about is it may come intuitively subject verb agreement, like he is, she is, but I am. So uh, it can be very painful if you are a novice, but once you, you're there, you're just there. And, um, Nowadays, we also have tools like Dr. Gasper and talked about Grammarly and even Gmail is doing it for us now. So, so it may be easy uh, if you start working on them. And, and if it is like you're talking about a, a singular noun and it's one thing, then, then there's a plural form in the, not a plural, but it'll be like rides, a monster eats, a boy reads, if it's like 10 boys read. So uh, that is how it goes. And then if you talk about two birds, then they, are, then they are discussing one bird is speaking. So this is subject word ag agreement. And if it is a single cat, the cat jumps. While if there are many cats, then the cats jump. So these uh, would come naturally, but uh, it can get tricky in science sometimes. Like when you talk about data, then data can assume the character of a singular verb or a plural verb, um, uh, singular noun. And, and singular verb is used, suppose we're talking about data as a data set. So then it's just one, right? Even if it has like thousand entries. So then we use um, a singular verb. After the survey data is collected, it will be analyzed. But if you talk about the data components, the survey data were collected and analyzed. So sometimes it can just leave you a little confused, but be aware the data is one such um, noun where it can be referred to as a sing with a singular verb or a plural one. And then uh, compound subjects. So sometimes you see that there are two subjects, but it's actually referring to the same subject. Developer and producer of the COVID vaccine is arriving soon. 
factory developer and uh, producer are not different. They're the same, right? So it's a compound subject. So don't get confused and don't say are here. It is like is. Um, because both subjects are actually are the same person. So this can be confusing. It's good to be aware that no rule is permanent in English. And sometimes there's always a situation where you have to break it. And uh, there are collective nouns uh, like... A singular verb is used when the group as a whole unit, just what I talked about, the number of patients treated in the new COVID vaccine was the largest in history because they're talking about the number, like the patients all together and what the number was. So it was like one number. So then it becomes was. But if it is like many individuals in the group, a number of patients were treated with the new COVID vaccine. So these are instances where you may be left confused. And um, if you're using everybody, then uh, it is is because they signify like they're just one unit. And then if you um, say each person, then it's like singular, then you say was. And then if many healthcare workers, then it's many, you know, so it says were uh, indefinite pronoun. And um, this is something she'll come across often in science, like you'll be comparing, you know, mental condition of patient A is better than that of patient B, so then is subordinating conjunction, which you should familiarize yourself with. And uh, you can also have coordinating conjunctions, which you often use in long sentences, but then you break them down and then you'll use them less often. So, and, but, or not yet, or so. All correlative conjunctions, like correlative, either, neither, or, nor, um, not only, but also, so we used it before. So these are used for parallelism. And uh, largely when you come to discussion, this is something which I feel is very easy to address because you're all intelligent people, you're conducting great research, you just need to voice it out well. Put it uh, down in a good uh, structured manner. So one is the macro structure, overall text organ. You know that it's IMRAD, right? Louis Pasteur described that way back, maybe I think 1600 or something. So you know how it is. But when you start writing your discussion, there will be a macro organization. So how do you organize it? First, you summarize your key findings. And then which is the most important finding? You discuss that in the first paragraph. And then maybe you compare with the other studies in the next paragraph. Then you fill in some stuff in between. And then there's a limitation and then the strength and then conclusion. So this is the macro structure, which I'm sure all of you know about. And then there's micro, the wording, you know, the meta discourse, which which is a skill to acquire, comes with time and take it easy. And then there's something called meso level. So this is what we will talk about. Like, suppose you're developing a paragraph. Uh, how is a paragraph developed? So every paragraph has to carry one central theme with one central idea. And around that, we, you will have different offshoots coming off. So the first sentence will introduce the idea and then the second one will build on it. The third should be the concluding one, concluding one third of the last sentence. And a typical paragraph is around like 100 words. Maybe like if in every sentence, there are like nine to 10 words, so maybe 10 sentences at the max. So this is a balance you strive to achieve. And if there is no logical paragraph development, so sometimes you introduce two or three thoughts or the two thoughts, first and second sentence are not linked. So, you know, it looks weird and, and it's very stressful for the reader. So it'll say, I'd rather not read it. Why will the reviewer do that? It's, it's um, you know, an altruistic activity. I'm gonna just outrightly reject it. So have a clear uh, thought process, only one single idea and the first one introduces, the second one should logically build on the first sentence and use connectors. So we will also look at them in a bit, like although, however, therefore, you know, this data was missing in literature. Therefore, we are uh, we decided to work on this. And it's very important to maintain that point of view and all of you have it. You just need to sit and organize it and deficiencies in the overall structure of a paragraph is again, um, the most important thing which gets the manuscript struck off. Uh, the journal system. So why it is important? Because not only is the content important, I'm sure you all, all of you have great content, but then coherence, it should make sense. It should not be stressful to read. There should be logic in the flow. I think should just come in one after the other. It should be, it's, it's art and it's like dreamy and you, you all know it, but you just, it comes with practice. And the first one is unity. So unity implies all sentences in a single paragraph relate to one particular focus. 
Second is coherence. So the sentences in a para should be arranged in a logical manner. Again, we are just going over this again and again so that it's hammered into everyone's system today. And the final principle lays emphasis on the development of paragraphs, which should not only present ideas, but also explain them and support. So the final one, we have enough evidence of this cousin. So yeah, case load, this is how it is. And that's what we think. So you can um, think of um, a very delicious burger and a paragraphing uh, scale is very much akin to this uh, topic sentence, supporting details, which is, you know, the tomatoes, lettuce, meat, a colorful vocabulary like mustard, ketchup. It's okay if you don't have that, it's not mandatory. And then concluding sentence at the bottom one. So remember this uh, ground rule, 100 words on an average, and you should be good. Try not to ruin unity which is very, very important because uh, when you combine several ideas in one paragraph, immediately the reviewer would know that, okay, this is a novice writing the paper. I don't want this paper. It either goes for revision or into the dustbin. So do not do that. Be very crystal clear in your ideas and maybe write them down on a paper before you type it out. Sometimes people just start having sentences which are uh, paragraphs which are one sentence long, which is again like very, um, almost like insulting to the eye, so <laughs> never do that. It can be exhausting and uh, it doesn't make sense. So uh, they can be paragraphs with very long sentences. Again, uh, something should avoid and run on sentences. Again, a common mistake, like two different ideas, just stitched together with a comma, which is not required and very easy to address. Uh, something we should all uh, strive for. So uh, take home is very simple. One idea, one paragraph, build your paragraphs based on deductive reasoning. And this is something everyone is very much capable of to into science and use transition devices, logical connectors. Therefore, henceforth, you know, that way in relationship between sentences in one paragraph and balance out 100 words on an average. Now, some of you may have uh, been feeling like totally bombarded or lost, but remember English uh, is no longer a monolith. It is an incredible state of flux and uh, something to remember about. Remember always, and this is definitely the good news, although we will leave the great debate for another day uh, if it is time for Slavic English yet, maybe someday. So um, because this is such a huge topic, uh, Definitely would refer you to some uh, wonderful articles uh, by Prof. Saknova. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Paragraphing and many more. Uh, the series in JKMS editing writing. I think these are the best and richest, quickest source if you're looking for like efficiency and you're very busy in the laboratory or elsewhere. And then there are the guidelines. Thank you and happy to take questions. Uh, dear Latika, uh, thank you very much for your amazing uh, presentation. Not only useful, helpful, but also eye-catching uh, and with humor. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and I have one question uh, to you. Uh, which uh, software would you recommend uh, to our non-anglophone authors uh, for English um, writing and editing? Uh, or probably it's much better to ask about help um, uh, in uh, more experienced uh, colleagues uh, in uh, published uh, articles in English. Uh, what is your opinion? So it totally depends on your level of expertise because I feel we're never too perfect. And I've even worked with uh, colleagues from, you know, the United States, the United Kingdom, sometimes work with some colleagues, uh, some uh, native English speakers from the United Kingdom closely. And you know, uh, their spoken English is wonderful, but written English may not be like 10%. And they also revise their manuscripts like five or six times. It's, it was, uh, you know, truly a pleasure to see that and realize that, you know, we're not that bad after all. Sometimes we're just like short of time or we're lazy or, you know, with effort, we can do it. And uh, yeah, if someone is, a, is an absolute novice and just starting out, then uh, it'll need more effort. So maybe like, um, we discussed this previously also like Gmail is now offering this is absolutely free so maybe you just paste it out in Gmail it'll correct a lot of it and uh, Grammarly is another one which is uh, definitely offering some uh, wonderful services so uh, there are many more and I've heard some are better although I haven't tried them out but some versions of Grammarly are free and uh, yes uh, getting the flow and and the uh, descriptions right and uh, the organizational context this is something which these softwares will not do 
and i feel this is something which students can acquire by just um, working with mentors and this is largely what mentors do you know we just give direction to thought i feel like the younger generation is brilliant and they have wonderful ideas and sometimes more than our uh, you know uh, ticking neurons can get but uh, <laughs> it is just organizing and and that definitely you do with mentors so this is one aspect uh, so it's there's no perfect rule for it it's just uh, a mix of different approaches depending on what you need and your area of deficit thank you and i see that our participants also use grammarly um, dr velikova grammarly is really useful and educative yes <laughs> thank you dr arman uh, would you like to add something uh, or ask some questions yes uh, first of all mm, uh... I'd like to thank uh, Latika for uh, informative and elegant presentation. Uh, Latika is a medic, but uh, she presents uh, language issues uh, of uh, of use to even to link this. These this presentation is also useful to link this as well. So I think that uh, the main point is to uh, read read more, uh, improve English, and uh, recall all basic rules, English rules, uh, be simple, structure simple sentences, uh, avoid paragraphs with just one sentence, uh, have a logical order in, uh, in, a, in, the, in a text. Yeah, and uh, if you need, you may use uh, software. I, I know that you, sometimes Latika uh, uses uh, software to improve, uh, to rectify language, but uh, I, sometimes I suggest her to avoid using uh, software because her own style is perfect. And I read her articles with great pleasure. Thank you very much, Latika. And I hope we'll, we'll uh, produce more joint articles on language issues, on other issues. Uh, thank you very much for your cooperation. Thanks a lot. And for this, for today's presentation as well. Uh, now, Olena, we have uh, Professor Srechko Gajovic with us. Probably uh, uh, some of us or all of us know Professor Srechko Gajovic, who is uh, uh, former editor-in-chief of Croatian Medical Journal. Uh, who, who is neuroscientist, uh, an author with a number of great publications in uh, good English journals, uh, regardless of their impact factors and other uh, fancy metrics. Uh, Srechko Gajovic is also a nice chap and also very friendly to Ukrainians. And uh, he uh, mentioned that uh, he visited Ukraine before. Uh, I think Ternopil, he, he will correct me if I'm wrong. And also Srechko Gajovic, when he was editor in chief, he accepted a number of great articles from Ukraine. I know that it's quite difficult for Ukrainian authors to publish in good English journals and Croatian medical journal is a sort of small lancet. So it's a European flagship journal and it's quite difficult to publish, but some of Ukrainian experts, particularly Pro Professor Rostislav Stoika and uh, other guys from Lviv, they managed to publish in Croatian Medical Journal. Today, he will, uh, Professor Srechko Gajovic will, will share his experience, editorial experience, and hopefully he will also help Central Asian and Eastern European authors to publish more with Croatian Medical Journal. So Olena, please introduce and uh, hand over to <laughs> Professor Srechko Gajovic. Uh, Professor Srechko Gajovic, welcome <laughs> to our webinar. Uh, and uh, I know that you are going generously uh, to share with us uh, your rich uh, editors and author experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and you can uh, share with us your screen. <laughs> so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, when I, if I'm, uh, ah, sorry, just a second. Yes, yes. Uh, 
I, I need to do something because um, I need to allow Zoom to, to share it. So just a second, yes, because yes. I need to identify myself uh, for this computer. Don't worry, Say, we have okay. enough time. <laughs> oh my God. So I, I will just go out and come back very soon. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. okay. Olena, you may uh, also uh, try to uh, un unmute and uh, allow him to share his screen. Probably it's a technical issue, but I think he will manage. Yes. Properly. So Srečko Gajovic uh, published a lot on knowledge landscapes on science communication. And when I was a um, section editor for Croatian Medical Journal, I edited science communication. But uh, in parallel to that, Professor Srečko Gajovic uh, edited knowledge landscapes section also quite interesting and I hope you will also some of you will read these articles so Srečko Gajovic over to you Professor Srečko can you hear me yes yeah. okay uh, yeah. excellent everything oh, is fine <laughs> thank you uh, it is probably zoom you know up uh, upgrade it and yes. <laughs> I have to give it all the permissions but every, all technical things are are solved <laughs> So now I have to say hello, friends, because uh, some of you maybe uh, see me here first time, but some of uh, you are indeed my friends. So first, Armin, thank you for uh, inviting me here. And then there are at least three of people which I recognized on the list, uh, which I know very well, which uh, uh, are which we meet together. And uh, I was not in Thermopyl. I would like to go there. I was only in Lviv. Uh, and uh, just uh, for people in Lviv, I, I don't know actually about Thermopyl, but I think not. But the funny thing is, I'm from Zagreb, Croatia, and Zagreb and Lviv, we were in the same country, you know. We, uh, that, that there is a part of Ukraine which were together with Croatia in the Austrian Hungarian Empire. So it is very funny that we think that we are now across the many borders, but actually there are some at some moments together. And I think we have so many similarities together. So uh, this is the reason why we actually try to join forces and try to do better science in Croatia, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, in Armenia, wherever you know we are the good friends, we should do very good science. So let me go through my uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, mainly considered by uh, Croatian, uh, Croatian Medical Journal. So let, ah, very nice. So uh, which would next year will be already 30 years old, uh, which is, I would say it is like a blink of the eye, how fast the time goes, because I know the, the time when actually the Croatia Medical Journal was founded by their first editors. And at this moment, Croatia wanted to have some kind of a journal which will open, uh, which will be like a window for a Croatian scientist to actually show their scientific excellence. And uh, then we, of course, realized that the Croatian scientists are a very small group of scientists. We could be excellent, but still we are, we are very small. So we have to actually be not only a window for uh, Croatians, but as well for many other nations, including this all community, which we, uh, which we call emerging countries, because uh, the power of these emerging countries is actually enormous. And these emerging countries can indeed contribute intensively and importantly uh, to the scientific community. So I was editor in chief uh, of six years. So from 2011, 2017. And uh, this is meant like a joke. So says years of healthy eating and exercise have unfortunately added five more years to Melvin's life. Uh, some messages of this. First, uh, the quality of life is indeed important. Second, uh, the very important medical issue is the aging of the population. The third, there is so much of technologization of medicine right now, which is uh, rather scary for the general population. Uh, but uh, this is how the medicine is uh, built on. 
And uh, to solve all, actually this riddle of technologization, emerging uh, uh, health issues like aging, and help people to uh, have better life quality. There are so many questions which are really here, science uh, is here to address this question, to solve them and to, and to push us uh, forward. Uh, and this was so important as well during the time of this pandemic, where actually the biomedical scientists came into focus because the pandemic was caused by a biological entity, a virus. And of course, the biomedical scientists were there. So the clinicians were there together with the patients. The biomedical scientists understood the virus, what's going on, what's going on in our body. So there were, this, was, this is actually right now, the high time for biomedical researchers. And uh, I, I will just show very shortly uh, one message which I uh, somehow with the help of Armin made uh, for uh, Central Asian Journal of Medical Hypothesis and Ethics, that actually right now we are in, in a, some, uh, uh, it is already like, like, a, like a big question because we can have an opinion, but our opinions is a bit of pseudoscience. And we could actually try to choose, should we have an opinion? and defend, you know, I'm very smart. I have opinion, I must be right. Uh, I have as well very lot of experience indeed. All we should actually engage in a very painful process of construct a scientific study, which will actually bring us some answers. And I was the one arguing that actually the good uh, research studies have no alternatives. This is the best. So uh, in particular, we, in this moment, when the start of the pandemic, our experience about the virus, so our empirical uh, knowledge was really low. The, the priority was to create studies, not to make opinions and saying, oh, I, I know that this should be like this. And you, would, you have actually witnessed this, that there were many people, and this was easy and the very extreme, extremely influential saying, I know how to do it. So in order to present your study, you need journals, you need high quality journals. And this is the license that what you are saying is grounded, has, has sense, is done in a scientific way. So Croatian Medical Journal is part of this family. It is independent journal, means we are not part of a big, a chain of other journals. We don't belong to Elsevier. We don't belong to the Springer. So we are independent. And I will show you as well what is the structure of this independent journal. But as well, this is with the help of Armin, I actually claimed that actually these independent journals are very big power for the future of medical publishing. So, of course, if you want that your voice would be heard, you need to speak in English. This is so simple. Uh, our impact factor is relatively low, rather, right now. This is the, the, as well the consequence of some kind of editorial changes after my editorialship, as well of some internal problems. So we hope it will go better. And it will go better if there will be good uh, authors wanting to publish in this journal. And we have something which is called author helpful policy, which means that in our journal, if the paper is not really perfect, there will be quite a lot of effort to improve this, this paper. However, there, there is something which cannot be compromised. You need to have the essence. So if we recognize that what is written inside is scientifically very important and done with scientific rigor, then we would help you to make it nicer. So that means what we are providing, we cannot provide you the product. The product is your product, but if your product needs a very nice envelope, and this is what Latika actually helped you, how you would wrap your product in a very nice envelope. So it will be palatable to the editors, to the reviewers and to the readers. This is where we can jump in because we do we have this author helpful policy in order to help you to go further 
and that your final product, I mean, your manuscript will be nice when it will be published. So we have statistical editor, we have um, language editor, we have production editor. So these three editors actually help authors to do it in a proper way. So the final product, will, uh, the final paper will be nice. Uh, and of course, we need to do it in a very ethical way. So we checked for the plagiarism. So plagiarism is really important issue today. So everybody should be aware of this and don't play with it. Uh, and about how it is organized. So if, we are, if you're independent, still you need the formal organization. So the owners of C, uh, CMJ, Croatian Medical Journals, are the major universities in Croatia. And they are represented in a governing structure and the editor is part of this. So I hoped actually that I would be able to revise this and that the CMJ could be completely independent. So of course the owners are there, but there would be need of complete independency of some kind, how the journal will uh, work on a, on, a, on a scientific market, but this did not happen. I, I will explain why I think that the reform, this reform is important, because I was an employee of one of these uni uh, universities when I was editor-in-chief, and I had my grants, I had my PhD students, I had my department, and the dean was above me. So if my editorial policy clashes with the dean's view, I'm in danger. So I was lucky to have a very good dean who re recognized this conflict of interest and who never interfered in the editorial policy. However, the, editorial, the independence of editorial policy is really important for the journal. So if your organization of the, of the journal is so that you depend to the guy which is above you, then uh, this will not work this, will, this is difficult work. It could work, but it is difficult. Um, moreover, so who is paying for all this thing? And this is funny. These are actually Croatian taxpayers because there is a public money which is pumped in the journal. So the owners actually uh, compete for public money dedicated for the public, uh, for the uh, scientific journals in Croatia, and this is where the com money comes from. And uh, this means that we are not going to take money from you for publishing, and we are not going to take money from you if you are going to read what is uh, published in Croatian Medical Journal. So everything is free. So this is another claim which I want to share with you, that we have something which is called gold open access. But in gold open access, whatever you want to read is for free. But for gold open access, I sometimes joke, I say you have to pay with gold. So if you want to publish in a gold open access, you need to pay so-called processing fees. And these processing fees are quite expensive, I have to tell you, you know this from your own experience. In Croatia Medical Journal, there are no processing fees, no publication charges, and you can actually, um, publish completely for free. Why? Because of creation taxpayers putting money in the journal. So is it a lot of money? Actually, not so much. And why creation taxpayers would actually pay Ukrainians to publish in creation medical journal? Because it makes 100 times sense. This is the best promotion of Croatia ever. You know, if you know that there is a high quality journal, Croatian Medical Journal, where you are going to publish there as Ukrainians for free, and you would get some help from the Croatians to make it as a good paper. Wow. So Croatians are then the best in the world and Croatian taxpayers should be happy. So we have our very specific uh, title pages, which are designed for every issue. Uh, these are just some of these designs. The, every issue has some kind of specific topic. There is a dedicated web page, nothing new. There is a very um, homemade uh, manuscript submission system. And what is the good news? The Ukrainian Biochemical Journal currently took 
over as well this uh, balance group submission system. So we now share uh, Croatian Medical Journal and Korean Biochemical Journal have the same manuscript submission system right now, which is another way. So nice European project uh, product, which is now shared among the friends. The, there is a fee. Again, this fee is not so important. It's not so big that the uh, Ukrainian Biochemical Journal would not afford it or Croatian Medical Journal would not afford it. So it's actually the Croatian product. And we have, of course, we need to be active on social networks. So there's Facebook and there's Twitter account. And we publish classical uh, range of uh, publication types. Of course, the research articles are those which really count. And these are some, some of the determinants of every editorial policy. So what, what they want to publish is novelty. And then there is this appropriate design, appropriate statistics, clarity of results, and what would be the impact. And I can tell you the Croatian Medical Journal did not really insist on this. Uh, would it be highly cited? However, the commercial journals, or better to say the journals belonging to the commercial publishers have to think about it. And this is why sometimes you get rejected because you are not really high priority. So we never rejected a good study because it is not of high priority of Croatian Medical Journal. And uh, if you are small, if you are independent, how you would fight this competition of uh, big commercial publishers? It's that you do really, really good job. And the core of this job is to understand the scientific rigor of the research studies. And I would say the core of every researcher doing research in Croatia, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan or Armenia is to do it in a top class, by top class scientific rigor. But then, because then it is unbeatable. You cannot beat the study, which is done with the perfect scientific rigor. And of course, to claim this, you need to describe this in a very detail. So of course, your experimental design should be perfect. Your statistics should be right. Those needed for these specific questions. And this needs to be reported. This cannot be somehow hidden in your paper. And you know that uh, we are more and more trying to find out these publication biases. So creation medical journal really insisted that everything is clear and that there are no publication biases if possible. So I will then now continue for more perspective, not from the medical journal, uh, but more from the author. And you know, the author are the pressure, publish or perish. But there is another part of this pressure that actually what you can uh, actually make is publish and perish. Why? because you publish something which is wrong, which is not correct. And you know, when something is written and published, this is forever. I don't want to frighten you, but there are many examples, not in Croatia, but in many countries where actually the minister of some, they found him a paper X, which he did something like 20 years ago and say, oh, look, the guy's plagiator, oh, look, this is not really original. Look, this is a double publication or whatever. So whatever you publish, it should be perfect in the ethical and scientific way because it will stay forever. This is, un, you, you cannot delete it anymore. It will determine you for life. So this is why I'm putting here publish and perish because you are actually kill your scientific career. So, Sometimes I joke, so you could do it in Croatian Medical Journal, so we take care about you. But any whatever journal, your door to the, to the end of your research reputation. So first, how you can add, uh, end your research reputation is copy-paste, plagiarism. And how frequent it is, we did. We have very long statistics. So this is one of the papers, which is goes in the row. So just shortly, uh, it is uh, hidden somewhere here, but there is like 10% of the papers 
which are submitted to Croatian Medical Journal have some kind of serious level of plagiarism. This is a huge amount, incredible, actually. So this, is, this was already mentioned here several times, so allow me to say, because it's so important. So this web page on Princeton, so you, you can, can see it here, and it's easy, you just write plagiarism Princeton, and this will pop up, is very useful. And I will go very short because you hear already something about it. If you take the whole paragraphs and just copy paste it, this is clear plagiarism. This is not a secret now, but you can do it. If you really want to take a whole chapter because it serves your purpose, you can do it if you copy the passage exactly, place it in quotation marks inside the author, then it is legal. But of course, it needs to have sense. So you, ne you need to uh, um, say why you do this. Then copy here, copy there. We, we call it, it's like collage. And this is again plagiarism. Even very small, if, if this very small term is so important, it could be as well plagiarism. So he said, hi heroic terms, you see high, even in high heroic terms, were not put it in quotes and the reference could be plagiarism. And finally, you don't plagiarism, you, you actually just change a bit the sentences. No software will find this. However, it is again plagiarism if you don't say it by your own words and if you don't give your own message. So in this case, so first, this is another clear example of plagiarism. So first, use your own words and structure, and second, place a citation. So placing a citation was obviously really important for all these three steps. So avoid plagiarism in any, any type. But you can make other mistakes. So study repetition or novelty. You know, you have one group of patients and you show this, then you wait for two years, you take another group of patients, so why not to show the same? So this is not ethically completely wrong because you want to confirm your, your previous results, but it is a borderline because there is no novelty because the life changes. So you need to pack it up in something new. You can confirm your results, but you need to show something new. Otherwise, it has no much sense. Then, of course, this is maybe really important for Ukrainians. So you have a beautiful paper which you publish in Ukrainian. Then you take a part of it and add some new data and you want to publish this in an English version. No, this is self-plagiarism. So whatever is published in Ukrainian, in Croatian, in any language, it is published. So cannot be translated in English and, say, and you can sell it again. So one of my messages is actually never publish in national language, always publish in English. This is really important because if you, if you have something to publish, if you don't have something to publish, don't publish it in Ukrainian either because it has no sense. Then ghost authorship means uh, you are invited by a good friend to, he said, don't worry, I, I have a great story. Would you like to be co-author? We are good friends. So you are co-author, you don't understand the topic. And this could be again, source of the trouble, not to me that this is very unethical to be ghost authorship. The ghost authorship is as well, there is a, there is a very unethical behavior of people buying the publication. So how, how you could buy good quality publications? The Ukrainians actually publish something in Ukrainian. This is a good quality paper. Then come other guys who actually scroll this and find out, oh, very nice publication. They translate this in English. They change the numbers. They change the institution and sell it on the market. So first you lost because you did a very good story in Ukrainian, which nobody, sorry, only Ukrainians understand, and Croatians sometimes. And your study was taken out by others, changed in the uh, English and sold on the market. 
Uh, so you you lose you, lo you lost stuff. And salami publishing means if you have one sample, it could be a sample of molecules, it could be sample of mice, it could be patients. From one group of patients, one group of samples, you can produce only one study, and you should produce one study. There is no, this is not a good idea that one group of patients, you do something else, another something else, and so on and so on. So don't use one single group sample for more studies. This is called salami publishing. Okay, so bad science. Bad science is a big problem. We now calculated 80%. One is that you are unethical. Another is that you do bad science. It means you don't have controls. Your controls are sloppy. You don't really measure it properly and so on and so on. So this is a bad science. It is very difficult to be detected. And it is a big problem. This is why scientific rigor is really, really important. So we currently judge that maybe even 80% of studies cannot be reproduced because either it is not described in a way to be reproduced or B, it is just unreproducible because there is flop, sloppy science, bad science, this is it. So use for this, the guidelines, they are all collected on this web page, Equator Network. So really important to use guidelines. And again, use English just to shorten this. And uh, this is a declaration which uh, was done as well with the help of Armen and uh, Croatian and Bosnian friends and Serbian friends. Uh, what the, how actually this ethical behavior, integrity, is important if you want to make a good journal, if you want to be a good scientist. And I will just now just continue very shortly about this current business model. The current business model is actually that you have to pay processing fees for the publishers. The publishing is extremely lucrative business. So they, they think that the profit margin in publishing is higher than Google. And uh, there is no way that this would be remediated right now. So uh, uh, there is some idea, but nothing actually really happens. And obviously, if these established publishers have, are, uh, can earn so much money, why not to take a bit out of it? So this is so-called predatory publishing. And this is a bit of very strange Robin Hood because these guys, have very high prices, the, the established commercial publishers. They do it everything right. They're very ethical. However, the prices are so high that sometimes they prohibit the small group of, let's say, Ukrainian scientists to publish. So they are then offer alternative, lower price, easy to publish, but it's predatory. So again, be careful. Don't to, um, be trapped by predatory publishing. And again, those in diamond open access, really don't pay anything. These beautiful journals are so important. Uh, and uh, there was a list of predatory publishers where uh, Jeffrey Beal was uh, somehow stopped to do it. There is some kind of alternative list. And uh, again, I tried to calculate in this paper how, how actually, how can you survive if you need to pay? So I calculate if there's, if you want, need to pay for your publication, and this is like 3000 euro, and you want to publish five papers by your group per year, because you're active scientist. So five times 3000 euro, this is 15,000 euro. So that means that you need to, for this, you need to get a grant of 150 euro, 150,000 euros per year. So there is no grant of 150,000 euros per year in, in Ukraine, nor in Croatia, because they just put it in a small amounts. So I said, this is a waste of money. Here I claimed that Croatia and Ukraine, they face their money with the small grants because people cannot even publish. So to be discussed maybe later. So never forget whatever you do. Don't do it because it's your career, 
because your boss said this to you, because I know it will be published somewhere, because it has, do it because it has a sense to solve some important scientific issue, to do something for your community, to increase the amount of knowledge, because this is really important for the humanity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dia Srechko, thank you very much for your excellent and very motivational for our participant <laughs> talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sure that uh, after your presentation, all our participants will publish their great article in English, only in English, uh, in uh, ethical and uh, high rank uh, journals. Thank you very much. Uh, Olena, I'll just, I just want to co comment on uh, Srechko's uh, lecture. So it's very informative and uh, very inspirational for all of us, for uh, novice authors, seasoned authors, journal editors. One of the most important messages uh, of Srechko's presentation was about pseudo-scientific articles. All our authors who wish to publish something they should rely on available evidence and they should produce that evidence. Otherwise, all our publications will be uh, as, uh, pseudo scientific articles. So, opinion of experts, so called experts, is important, but that opinion again should be based on available evidence, whether mm, it's a, a large trial, large cohort study, or series, case series. So evidence is a core of scientific article and all our participants should uh, try their best to publish truly scientific articles, evidence-based scientific articles. Also, another important pro point from Srechko's presentation, uh, our journal editors should enforce equator network standards, otherwise, journal will publish again without any standards and indexability of these journals will be low. If a, an author wants to be published uh, qualitative or quantitative study, uh, all types of studies now have equator network standards. So please try uh, to find relevant standard for your research, whether it's qualitative or quantitative and publish it. We published with Latika and with Olena uh, several survey studies. These are uh, qualitative studies, but again, we refer to standard, so-called um, uh, survey, survey standard, again, endorsed by Equator Network. And there are a number of other Equator Network standards. Indexability of journals also uh, low if uh, journals do not adhere to these standards. Let's say Medline encourages evidence-based publica evidence publications and accepts for English, uh, for uh, indexing Artic uh, journals with uh, evidence-based articles. The same with Scopus. Scopus also pays attention whether journal publishes sloppy or uh, small articles without evidence base or articles with robust methodology with uh, uh, solid scientific, uh, solid statistical base. So the role of statisticians also important. Try to improve uh, adherence to best statistical standards or uh, recheck articles by statistical editors. Croatian Medical Journal is one of the exemplary journals, European and uh, global journals, because they have uh, statistical editor and uh, research integrity editor. One of the best language editors. I uh, felt influence of that language editor my, on uh, my articles. And I hope that in Ukraine, you will also have the same language editor, research integrity editor and uh, statistical editor. And final point was about ethics uh, adherence. Uh, Croatian journals now meet all ethical standards. Croatia joined EU in 2013 because of adherence to these standards, because of 
transparency, and because of editorial independence. You now have a number of Ukrainian journals guided by chancellors, guided by university administration. That's unacceptable for most uh, democracies. So in editor in chief and editors in any small journal should be independent. They should be well paid and these payment should be for quality and independence. So Srechko, thank you very much. Thank you to all our Croatian friends and thank you to Croatia for supporting Eastern neighbors, Ukraine and other countries, and also not just European, but also Central Asia and Kazakhstan. A number of Kazakhstani fellows also uh, look at uh, Croatian targets and they always consider Croatian Medical Journal as one of the best and highly reputable target journal. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. We have one question, Professor, uh, from Mikhailo Kalinichenko about uh, possibility of publishing uh, article uh, in the field of anatomy uh, in the Croatian Medical Journal. Uh, indeed, uh, the anatomy is a completely good topic. Uh, this is welcome, welcomed. And of course, just adhere to all these rules, uh, which are given here, write a nice paper and send it. Uh, and uh, then you are, uh, you are going to be roasted by reviewers. Uh, this is what we cannot control. So reviewers will give the verdict. Uh, I just have to say, uh, one of the uh, highlights of uh, my editorial was uh, when there, there was a young Ukrainian lady coming to me saying, oh, my first paper was published in Croatian Medical Journal. And she was so proud on herself. And, but I was as well proud on her because, you know, if your first paper is published in Croatian Medical Journal and you know it is open for the world, it is directly full, full text in PubMed and so on. You, may, you, you already reach some kind of, uh, let's say, to be standard where you are going to develop yourself. So I think this is always try to reach. And of course, there are even better journals than Croatian Medical Journal. So always try to reach as much better as you can. And of course, you're welcome. So you, of course, can try. And the reviewers here to make the verdict. Just so please go on. My colleagues from Danilo Halitsky, Lviv National Medical University, are very proud that uh, they published uh, their articles uh, in Croatian Medical uh, Journal <laughs> because it's yeah. really a flagship uh, medical journal. Thank you. Uh, just one question. Srechko, uh, Croatian Medical Journal is indexed by Medline, something uh, that uh, difficult to achieve uh, by most Ukrainian journals, journal editors. Your journal is uh, covered by Science Citation Index Expanded. Again, most Ukrainian journals are simply covered by Emerging Sources Citation Index uh, without uh, high citation numbers and no chances of entering uh, Science Citation Index Expanded. Your journal is covered by PubMed Central. Again, there are no any uh, Ukrainian journal archived by PubMed Central because of language, because of difficulties with X JATS XML uh, conversion, and because of editorial laziness. There are agents uh, supporting and helping to improve English, convert to JATS uh, XML, but no one is interested in uh, archiving by PubMed Central. Another good point for uh, Croatian Medical Journal, it's covered by current contents. Only few best scientific journals are accepted by uh, current contents for uh, coverage. Only the best few handful of best journals are accepted by current contents. It's not part of Web of Science core collection, but still reputable database. So Srechko, a question is how your journal, small journal, relatively small journal publishing around 150 articles managed to enter all these reputable databases? Uh, 
so this was this was done by editors which I were before me. So I have to say that uh, they they invested uh, most of the work. So, but I would say the key is to, to you have to prove high quality. So for, if you if you say that you uh, we we go out six times per year, that means that at at the end you, this means end of February you have to be published. End of April, you have to be published. There is no a day that you should be, you could be late. So this is you, you appear at exactly time slots as it is. Then, of course, the, the whole, how it looks should be super, super professional. And this was, uh, Aaron mentioned this, that we did do some very important work that uh, the, this could be somehow transformed in XML format. And this XML format, the PubMed, the PubMed does not invest any anything. We just submit it, and PubMed takes this XML format, and this is it. So they just then afterwards check if everything is correct. But they don't take your paper, and they will transfer it and put in PubMed Central for a full text. You have to prepare it by yourself. So there are some skills which people should learn. And it's therefore, there you have the editorial office, there you have the journal. This costs some money. I have to tell you, this costs some money. But this is not so expensive. If you would calculate it, how many Ukrainians publish outside and pay 3,000 euro for their papers. So if you take just a small piece of this and actually make a very good journal, this I think is important. Or we can collect our connect our forces. This is, I think, as well as a good idea. This is what Sarajevo Declaration was about. About that, the small independent journals should know how to do it, share the knowledge, share the skills, and so everybody is independent. Everybody could do what I want, but however, the level of the journal. This is where we need to help each other. How all these journals adhering to Sarajevo Declaration actually would reach this level. And of course, then you can uh, call, hello, uh, Croatian Medical Journal, hello, this journal. Could you help me? How you have done this? And everybody will help. So this is this community which can really help each other. And you should rely to this community. And uh, for example, this way, how Ukrainian Biochemical Journal use the same uh, submission system as Croatian Medical Journal is a result of this cooperation. Thank, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Srečko. Hopefully, uh, Ukrainian editors will uh, start thinking about XML <laughs> conversion <laughs> and PubMed Central archiving. Unfortunately, a number of Ukrainian journals uh, were delisted by Medline in 2017 simply because they didn't respond to a Medline call to X, uh, for, for XML conversion. And they didn't find any agent uh, to help them convert uh, met metadata of their articles, not full text metadata. And this is why uh, more than 10 Ukrainian journals were delisted, Eastern European journal journals and Croatian journals as well, because of editorial laziness. They didn't try to find an agent capable of XML conversion. So thank you for your point. C can I just say one small thing? We are regularly offered to be bought. So big commercial publisher comes to us and say, why you worry? We would do all job instead of you. And we are give even giving you money for this. Why this is important to have this in-house in your country? Because this is a very specific set of skills and this is a national treasure. So acquire, so my message is clear, acquire this set of skills because this is national treasure to help you people to not only to have a great journal, but to publish better papers because they can learn in your journal how to publish better papers. So I will, yeah, I already talked too much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your inspirational talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Dear colleagues, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Durga Misra, uh, who is one of the leading uh, Indian rheumatologists and also a highly skilled journal uh, editor, author, uh, reviewer. And he is going uh, to uh, discuss uh, some uh, issues related to systematic uh, review, uh, publishing systematic review in biomedical uh, journals. Uh, dear Durga, Welcome. Olena, I just uh, good like evening. to st stress out that yes. Durga's talk is a continuation of Srechko's talk. So uh, Srechko highlighted, uh, stressed the importance of really scientific article. There are hundreds of thousands of systematic reviews with meta-analysis, senseless articles, pointless, uh, based on laboratory data without any clinical implications. So these are called pseudoscientific articles. And if you would like to uh, publish strong articles, you need to know how to write systematic reviews. So Durga, stage is yours. Good evening, Dr. Olena, Dr. Armen, and colleagues. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present this. And I shall start sharing my screen. So I shall be discussing some finer points related to systematic reviews. We all know that the various types of review articles are systematic reviews, narrative reviews, and a proportion of systematic reviews may have meta-analysis in addition and a smaller proportion may be individual patient data meta-analysis. That is, they take the patient data at the individual level and analyze it de novo. So many of you must have seen this symbol, which is the symbol of the Cochrane collaboration. This actually represents the first Cochrane review that was published on antenatal corticosteroids for accelerating fetal lung maturation for women at risk of preterm birth. And the forest plot from this systematic review forms the emblem of the Cochrane collaboration. The Cochrane library is a group of uh, uh, systematic reviews published by the Cochrane collaboration. And we shall subsequently briefly have a look at what they are. In the ladder of evidence-based medicine, the highest evidence is that of systematic reviews of randomized control trials. And hence, systematic reviews are important, particularly for outcome studies related to interventions. The levels of evidence derived from systematic review meta-analysis of randomized control trials is 1A. And in the absence of a systematic review, it is 1B whereas other lesser forms of evidence are derived from at least one controlled study or a quasi-experimental study for 2B, non-experimental descriptive studies as comparative correlation or case control studies, or it is level four if it is just an expert opinion. And grades of recommendation, if they're based on level one evidence, then it is grade A, Otherwise, grade B, if based on level two or extrapolated from level one, grade C, if based on level three and or extrapolated from level one or two, and D is directly based on level four or extrapolated from level one, two, or three when there is no direct evidence for this. So systematic reviews are considered the highest form of evidence. And importantly, they form the cornerstone of guidelines for disease management, for disease diagnosis, etc. Systematic reviews may additionally contain meta-analysis. Young authors often confuse meta-analysis with systematic reviews. Meta-analysis is when you try to pull the data across systematic reviews and present it as a common measure. This is not essential for a systematic review and for a meta-analysis to be valid, that is for you to pull data across studies, first you must conduct a systematic review. So it is the systematic review that is important rather than a meta-analysis. A systematic review may not contain meta-analysis and increasingly these kind of papers are 
being recognized. Systematic reviews are considered as original articles by many journals, and they are prone to the same fallacies as other forms of scientific papers. And reading and interpreting a systematic review correctly is crucial for clinicians to understand published literature. And knowing how to conduct a systematic review and how to report it is critical for young researchers that want to synthesize the evidence base for a particular condition systematically. Systematic reviews could be intervention reviews most commonly. There are also diagnostic test accuracy reviews, methodology reviews, qualitative reviews, prognosis reviews, or overviews of systematic reviews. When you are actually looking at synthesizing the evidence from different systematic reviews in a particular area. The number of systematic reviews is increasing every day. This was an analysis undertaken at the end of 2017, wherein for different rheumatic diseases, one can see that before 2007 and from 2008 onwards, the number of systematic reviews that have been published in the latter period are much more than they were before 2007. So what I intend to do is look at some finer points with respect to systematic reviews. Distinguish guidelines for conduct of systematic reviews versus guidelines for reporting of systematic reviews. Talk about some tips regarding search strategies. Synthesis of data, whether a meta-analysis or synthesis without meta-analysis, which is being increasingly recognized as another form of systematic review without a meta-analysis. Some tips about assessing publication bias, about assessment of study quality, both for randomized control trials and observational studies, and certainty of outcomes. So guidelines for conduct versus guidelines for reporting. It is important to make this distinction right at the beginning. Often we refer to the PRISMA guidelines, which are pre preferred reporting standards for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Please note that these are reporting standards. These are not standards for conduct of systematic reviews. We shall see what are the recommended standards for the conduct of systematic reviews. You have, to, when you're writing your systematic review report, you should write it based on the guidelines provided by PRISMA, but not necessarily covers everything related to what you need to do when you're doing your systematic review. Hence the distinction between guidelines for conduct versus guidelines for reporting systematic reviews. The PRISMA reporting guidelines were published in 2009 and are currently undergoing a revision and they help identify various important points the title should reflect that it is a systematic review, should have a structured summary in the abstract, which should, like an original paper, present background, objective, data sources, study eligibility criteria, study appraisal synthesis methods, results, limitations, conclusions, and importantly, a systematic review registration number, which we shall see subsequently what this means. The introduction, what is the rationale for conducting the systematic review? As Dr. Arman said that so many systematic reviews are conducted without a clear rationale. Is there a need for a systematic review? Is there a systematic review in this particular area already? If there is a systematic review already existing, what additional does the current systematic review add that makes it worthy of being published? This is important to present in the introduction and then delineate the objectives of a systematic review in the form of a PICO questionnaire, participants, interventions, comparisons, outcomes, and study design. Then the methods, protocol and registration. We shall see that subsequently in a little bit more detail. Eligibility criteria, what are the specific study characteristics and what are the specific report characteristics used as criteria for eligibility in the rationale? Information sources, what sources have been searched? Here, the PRISMA guidelines mentioned full electronic strategy for at least one database. This has now been modified. I shall come to it again later. Study selection, process of selecting studies, data collection process, 
describe method of data extraction, data items, risk of bias in individual studies, that is risk of bias at a study level, summary measures, if any, and synthesis of results, whether in the form of a meta-analysis or qualitatively if a meta-analysis is not feasible. Risk of bias across studies, that was bias in the individual studies, bias across studies, such as publication bias. Additional analysis, if any, they need to be presented in the methods. Then the results with respect to study selection, study characteristics, risk of bias within studies, results of individual studies, synthesis of results, risk of bias across studies. Again, two different points. Within studies, that is, you assess the individual study quality. For example, for randomized controlled trials, you use the risk of bias 2, the Cochrane risk of bias 2 tool. Whereas risk of bias across studies refers to publication bias or any additional analysis that you may have done. Then discussion like in an original paper, a summary of evidence, what are the limitations, what are the conclusions, and any funding sources, including what role the funders played in the systematic review. A recent amendment, which was published earlier this year, has been the Prisma S statement. It is an extension of the Prisma statement for reporting literature searches and systematic reviews. The Prisma guidelines mandated the presentation of a search strategy in full, at least for one database. Whereas you may search across different databases. In fact, you should search across different databases so as not to miss relevant studies. What the Prisma S guidelines say that you should name each individual database is searched. And if they were searched on a platform, so state the name of the platform. What this means is that, for example, if you open PubMed, you can conduct a search of Medline via PubMed, but that is a limited search. But there are other platforms like Ovid, which enable you to conduct Medline search it is more powerful that is commonly used for systematic reviews. So which platform was used to search that also you need to mention. Study registries, have you searched any study registries, any online resources on browsing and whether the citations that were searched, how were they examined? Any contact was made with the original authors, experts, manufacturers or others and any other methods used during searches. The search strategies, full search strategies for each database and information source copied and pasted exactly as run with limits and restrictions. Limits with respect to time, restrictions with respect to language or study type, etc. Search filters, if they were used, any prior work. For example, there may be a systematic review on this topic that was published, say, five years back. Newer literature has evolved. So you may take the data from that systematic review and add further studies. So you need to refer to such prior work. Sorry. Updates, if you are updating searches at any particular time, how were they done? And the dates of the searches, you must mention when the last search occurred. Whether any peer review process was used for the search strategy and how were the records managed and how was duplication of records assessed. This is very important because this enables people to understand how exactly you have conducted your search and therefore understand the limitations of your search. Each and every search has its own limitations. It is important to transparently put this across so that the next person doing the search can address those limitations and may avoid any fallacies that you may have created in your search. So the Prisma S reporting guidelines are a very important component of the revision of the Prisma guidelines. And in fact, this is what Dr. Arman has been telling for years now in his landmark article that was published way back in 2011 and has been cited nearly 300 times now that comprehensive searches across databases are necessary for a systematic review and also are preferable for for narrative reviews. This is a landmark article. Most of you must have read it. If not, you can read it freely at this address. Uh, it is very useful, particularly for those who are starting out conducting reviews. Next, 
the prisma p reporting guidelines for a systematic review protocol these include almost the same information up to the methods these are guidelines to help you derive a systematic review protocol why is the systematic review protocol important because in the protocol you mention how you have planned the systematic review what are the databases you will search what are the selection criteria you will use what are the limits of searches how will you conduct these searches how will you analyze the searches how will you assess bias uh, assess risk of bias for individual studies as well as across studies publication bias and other biases how will you assess uh, further the certainty of evidence if you are planning to do that and how will you synthesize this data if you are conducting a meta analysis so this is important to delineate right before conducting a systematic review most importantly because the data synthesis in a systematic review protocol you clearly mention what are the primary and secondary outcomes how will you assess these outcomes and what subgroup analysis you will do with respect to your data certain analysis certain outcomes may be post hoc that is they may not be pre planned after you have conducted your literature search you may actually look at these outcomes you need to clearly delineate them as post hoc because it is likely that they will have some component of bias hence the importance of a systematic review protocol and the prisma p guideline helps you report a systematic review protocol so a protocol enables planning of a systematic review it delineates pre planned analysis from post hoc analysis because post hoc analysis are at greater risk of bias the next question that naturally comes is where to register systematic review protocols commonly prospero is the site that is used to register systematic review protocols however as of today prospero is quite preoccupied registering systematic reviews related to covid-19 which uh, at one stage were nearly 2000 systematic reviews registered related to covid-19 hence it is difficult to register protocols in a timely manner on prospero as of now and is likely to remain like this until the end of the covid-19 pandemic or at least until the pandemic abates to levels that allow normal activity to resume to some extent the cochrane library registers cochrane protocols however if you want to do a cochrane review it is difficult for novice reviewers to get involved you re- you generally require some experience before you are allowed to take part in a cochrane protocol a third option is to pre publish protocols in journals when you cannot take advantage of publishing in prospero you can pre publish protocols in journals provided a journal is willing to pre publish your protocol and the advantage of this is it helps the person who is reviewing your systematic review when you finally submit the manuscript to understand whether you have adhered to the methodology that you have proposed what analysis have you conducted pre planned and what analysis are conducted post hoc and it is important because this enhances the transparency of a systematic review and if you have registered protocols on prospero that are looking at the same aspect it is not worthwhile conducting another systematic review simply for the sake of it as dr armen said that so many systematic reviews thousands of systematic reviews are published many of them are redundant there are adequate systematic reviews on that particular topic hence it is not really necessary to publish them prospero helps identify such redundant reviews and avoid conducting such redundant reviews it is not essential to register a protocol but it is always better if you can do that certain journals do ask you details of whether you have a registered protocol for the systematic review and if not they ask you to mention that a protocol was not registered in the manuscript now we have looked at standards for reporting of systematic reviews what are standards for conduct of systematic reviews standards for conduct of systematic reviews of interventions are provided by cochrane collaboration in the cochrane handbook which is an excellent 
resource for anybody who is planning to conduct a systematic review. You must go through this and understand it and preferably have some colleagues teach you some of these aspects so that you know how to appropriately conduct a systematic review. This is a mistake that authors often make while writing their systematic review papers. They often say that the systematic review was conducted in line with PRISMA guidelines. PRISMA guidelines are not for conduct of systematic reviews, they're for reporting of systematic reviews. So what would be appropriate is if you conduct your systematic review as per the Cochrane handbook, particularly for systematic reviews of interventions, and if you report them subsequently based on the PRISMA guidelines. So these two distinctions are important for authors to make. Next, coming to adequacy of a literature search for a systematic review. It is not adequate to search just PubMed or Medline or PubMed Central. It must include diverse databases like Scopus, Embase, Web of Science, preferably all of them. Scopus includes all the data in Medline. However, you may also separately search for Medline through the OVID database. Conference proceedings, this is an area that not necessarily everybody will agree on. But many systematic reviewers prefer that you have searched relevant conference proceedings of at least major international conferences over the past three to five years, so that you do not miss out on any relevant information that may yet have to be published as a full paper. It is important that you try to not miss out on important information, relevant information that is not yet published, hence searching over the past three to five years is recommended by many systematic reviewers. Clinical trial registries, it is important to search the WHO, World Health Organization, International Clinical Trials Registry platform to identify ongoing trials or unpublished trials or trials that have been completed, but whose data has not yet been published as a full paper, but may be available on the clinical trial registry. It is important to include such studies if they're relevant to your systematic review. And the Cochrane database of controlled clinical trials, which is a very important resource, which practically registers most relevant clinical trials with respect to the biomedicine. And hence, if you search through this, you're unlikely to miss out on relevant controlled clinical trials. Regional databases may be included as per geographic location and as per the preference of the reviewers, but this is not essential. A literature search needs to be conducted independently by at least two different investigators. Differences resolved by mutual discussion, which maintenance of a paper trail. You can be asked at any time after you have submitted your manuscript or after your manuscript has got published as to how can you prove that you have actually conducted an independent literature search? You should maintain a paper trail for that for every systematic review that you conduct. A literature search shall lead on to a Prisma diagram, a Prisma flowchart. And now the Prisma S modification incorporates the need to provide search results as retrieved for each database. And you must detail include and included included an extra included studies at each step. Cochrane involves specialized search assistants to help with the search. Not everybody is able to do a Cochrane review. So very often you will find yourself and your colleagues conducting the searches and detailing included and excluded studies yourself. Synthesis of data, if quantitative synthesis is feasible and appropriate, it should be done. That is called as a meta-analysis. Otherwise it is acceptable to present in a descriptive format called as a synthesis without meta-analysis or a swim. Assessment of publication bias. Visually, you can assess them by means of final plots. We shall see an example in the subsequent slide. Mathematically by tests, such as the Egger test or the Beck test. These test against the null hypothesis of no small study effects. What they look at is small study effects. Small study effects could either be due to publication bias or it could be due to significant heterogeneity between studies. So the presence of a 
small study effect may actually be due to heterogeneity between studies. Hence, it is important to assess heterogeneity between the study results before actually commenting that this is publication bias. And one must be careful before assessing publication bias when there are fewer than 10 studies because the test for publication bias has low power, which means that with a smaller sample size, the test for publication bias may not actually be able to identify publication bias, hence it should not be used when, it, when there are fewer than 10 studies. This was a systematic review that we have conducted on skin fibrosis in systemic sclerosis and the effect of various DMARs. So as you can see, this is a funnel plot. Here you can see that when I'm taking all the studies together, I'm getting an agar test p-value of 0.017, which suggests the presence of small study effects. However, when I further categorize them into biological DMARDs, conventional DMARDs or targeted synthetic DMARDs. For targeted synthetic DMARDs, the number of studies is quite small, but for biological DMARDs and conventional DMARDs, as you can see, there is little evidence of publication bias. So by categorizing them with respect to the drug category, I am able to not get any evidence of publication bias. So this apparent publication bias here was actually due to heterogeneity between the studies. That is important to distinguish. Assessing study quality of randomized controlled trials. Currently, the tool that is recommended is the Cochrane Risk of Bias 2 tool, which assesses five domains. Domain one being risk of bias arising from the randomization process. Domain two, separately assessed for studying, assessing effect of assignment of intervention or effect of adhering of intervention. So depending on whether your outcome is related to effect of assignment of intervention, that is an intention to treat analysis or effect of adhering to intervention, that is a per protocol analysis, you need to use the appropriate domain two tool. There are two separate tools in this toolkit. The domain three is the risk of bias due to missing outcome data. Domain four is risk of bias in measurement of outcome. And domain five is the risk of bias in selection of the reported result. Very many studies may actually be rated as having low risk of bias across all domains, but they simply lose out because there may be risk of bias in selection of the reported result unless there is a pre-specified statistical analysis plan. Hence, it is important for prospective trialists to publish a statistical analysis plan in the clinical trial database that predates the time when the study has not yet been unblinded for blinded clinical trials so that it is clear that the statistical analysis was pre-planned and has not been done post hoc to maybe suit some certain situations. For example, uh, there may be a change in the primary or secondary outcomes. To avoid that, it is necessary to have a predefined, pre-published statistical analysis plan. No study is at no risk of bias. There are three categories of risk of bias, low, some concern, or high risk of bias. And the studies that are of the highest quality with respect to risk of bias are rated as low risk of bias. But if there is some concern in any of the domains, then it is likely that the study will be rated as having some concern about risk of bias. So this Cochrane Risk of Bias 2 tool is available freely online and can be completed for the studies with respective systematic review. For observational studies, there are various tools. And one of the commonly used tools is the Newcastle Ottawa Scale for case control and cohort studies. For case control studies, it looks at selection, comparability, and exposure, how these were ascertained with respect to the study and how the study defines these aspects. And for cohort studies, selection, comparability, and outcome. 
what is important to understand is that if your cohort study does not have a control group that has been selected appropriately, you are going to lose out points for comparability and for selection of the non-exposed cohort. So good quality cohort studies would have a comparator and not only would have a comparator, but the study subjects who encompass the comparators should be controlled for important factors, which include most commonly age and gender and for any other additional factors as well. So these are important points to take into consideration for cohort studies because, because of the lack of these points, many studies are downscored on the Newcastle Ottawa quality assessment scale. Next, coming to assessing certainty of outcomes. This uses the great profiler, which is another online tool that is available freely at the level of outcomes. This is not at the level of individual studies. Let's say I am conducting a systematic review of skin fibrosis, uh, effect of drugs on skin fibrosis and systemic sclerosis. So at the level of the outcome, that is change in skin fibrosis with a drug, not at the level of the individual study, not at the level of study one, study two, study three. The great profiler helps ascertain outcome certainty at the level of the outcome rather than at the level of the study. Whereas the risk of bias tool is conducted at the level of the study. For each study, you conduct a risk of bias or you conduct a quality assessment using a Newcastle Ottawa or other scales. So this grid pro tool looks like this, wherein you put in the number of studies, the study design, the risk of bias, inconsistency across studies, indirectness of measures used to uh, quantify the study outcomes, imprecision of outcomes across studies, and then you summarize the findings and it rates the certainty of the evidence for that particular outcome. For example, here I have on a trial basis, I have conducted this grade pro for a study of uh, colchicine compared to placebo for preventing recurrent cardiovascular event on, or death that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. So with the inputs that I have put, not necessarily related to this study, the certainty of evidence is very low. This could be rated as low or moderate or high certainty of evidence. So this is how you do a grade profiler at the level of the particular outcome. So this is done at the level of the outcome of preventing recurrent cardiovascular event or death. Narrative and systematic reviews both have a role in biomedicine. Narrative reviews have a flexible structure and format may vary across journals, whereas systematic reviews have a predefined strict structure Narrative reviews are often invited and written by subject experts, whereas systematic reviews, subject experts are desirable but not mandatory. Specialized training in searches through bibliographic databases and synthesizing evidence-based information is desirable for authors of narrative reviews and is mandatory for systematic reviews. A search strategy is advisable for a narrative review, mandatory for a systematic review. Pre-registration not required. Pre-registration is preferable for systematic reviews. A pre-published protocol generally is not available for a narrative review, whereas it is highly preferable for a systematic review. Narrative reviews have broad scope and several citable points, whereas systematic reviews have narrow scope with a few citable points. Quality assessment and or quantitative synthesis is not required for narrative reviews, whereas quality assessment is mandatory for systematic reviews, quantitative synthesis may be performed, which is called as meta-analysis, but it is not essential. Narrative reviews may not be considered as original articles, whereas some journals consider systematic reviews with meta-analysis as original research articles. There are various lessons that you can learn from retracted systematic reviews. They help us understand what are the reasons why this systematic reviews were retracted. This was an analysis we undertook at the end of 2017, where we analyzed retracted articles identified on a search on PubMed. 
and these articles were all systematic reviews that we looked at. The most common source of retracted systematic reviews was systematic reviews on interventions and systematic reviews on observational data, genetic data, systematic reviews were the next category and other observational data were the category with the least number of retractions. With reference to rheumatology, since I am a rheumatologist, I always want to look at what are the relevant points with respect to rheumatology. At that stage, we could identify six different systematic reviews which had been retracted. One of these was due to a methodological error. These two others were due to compromised or fake peer review, which is uh, the journals were duped by the authors with respect to selection of peer reviewers and therefore they received favorable reviews and were published wherein there were actually flaws that were missed. And there were some other articles which had missed studies, which had missed relevant literature in the specialty and hence they had methodological issues. And there was this particular systematic review on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in osteoarthritis which was actually retracted and a corrected version was republished after including them in studies. So it is important to have methodological rigor in systematic reviews because these are the major cause of retractions of published systematic reviews. To conclude, systematic reviews are based on scientific rigor in searching, analyzing and presenting results. They remain the highest level of evidence and it's best to learn from colleagues who have some training or experience in systematic reviews. I'm grateful to Dr. Armen who has taught me a lot about how to conduct systematic literature searches and also have had some other training with respect to systematic reviews. And hence, I may be aware of some of these points and I always try to help young colleagues to learn these points, which I have learned with some difficulty. It's best to pre-publish or register systematic reviews protocols to minimize the likelihood of biasing analysis. Thank you, and any questions are most welcome. Uh, dear Durga, thank you very much for your excellent and uh, really helpful presentation. And we have one question from Natalia Kushnir. Uh, she is a PhD student uh, in uh, Danilo Halitsky Lviv National Medical University. Uh, what would you recommend uh, as a first uh, step uh, in PhD research? Uh, to conduct a narrative review uh, or to conduct a systematic review uh, or both of them? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Olena. And uh, that's a very good question. What I would suggest is somebody who is conducting a PhD research or a dissertation is to thoroughly review the literature in the area quite broadly. First, to identify questions of relevance that need to be solved. And hence, what is important here is to conduct a narrative type of review rather than a systematic review because systematic reviews are very focused. They have a very narrow scope. A narrative review has a much more flexible structure and a broader scope. And hence, what is necessary here is to conduct a narrative review. In fact, uh, many a times we recommend our PhD scholars to write a narrative review after they have completed their original work because they have synthesized quite a bit of literature in the field that they're working on. Uh, okay, to obtain a broad uh, perspective uh, on a topic, yes? Uh, Durga. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Olena, thank you. Uh, Durga, thank you. I think mm -hmm. that Srechko may comment on this point because as far as I know, systematic reviews in Croatia can be defended as, as PhD studies. Just one systematic review, let's say Cochrane systematic review, and a PhD candidate can uh, be uh, awarded PhD title. What's your thought, thought on that? Uh, this is possible. Uh, it is a bit borderline. Uh, so we have more and more people which actually defend their PhD thesis with a systematic review. Uh, I would recommend uh, a combination. You know, if I would be a mentor 
And I think this is very nice that uh, you have uh, that actually the PhD is consisting from two studies. One is uh, a systematic review with meta-analysis or without, because sometimes you think there would be some uh, papers where eligible for meta-analysis, then you turn on, the, there are no there after you conduct your systematic review. And then you add uh, experimental study. However, then this experimental study is not so extensive in going so details um, together with this systematic review. So then the smaller study can actually fit together in, um, in PG thesis. Why I advise this both? Because some the candidates should actually show as, as a result of PhD thesis that is as well possible as has knowledge to conduct uh, let's say a classical study, not only systematic reviews. Because if you are PhD only with the systematic reviews, that means that you don't know how to do the experiment. So this small study somehow proves that you are as well proficient in pre uh, and doing uh, experimental studies. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, I, ha I have a question for Durga. So uh, there are some very specific statistical methods used for uh, meta-analysis, like this Eger uh, thing, then, uh, uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm new in this, Eger test, Beck test, then you have I-square uh, in meta-analysis. So uh, is the, are these all statistics explained in the handbook, which you showed, or we should refer to some other literature for these very specific meta-analysis related statistics? Uh, thank you, Professor Gajovic, uh, for the question. Uh, the Cochrane Handbook does tell you in detail about heterogeneity and also introduces the concept of publication bias. But uh, I further understood publication bias by, by actually reading the literature published from BMJ and other journals. So one may need to go beyond the Cochrane Handbook, but that's a good starting source. Yeah, okay, good point. Uh, Durga, there are many types of systematic reviews with or without meta-analysis. There is also systematic, uh, living systematic review. So, uh, but at the same time, living systematic review conducted by Cochrane experts. But nowadays we see a number of Chinese systematic reviews, again, redundant, they simply do the same, repeat the same methodology, and within five year uh, time uh, period, they simply repeat and publish slightly different systematic review with slightly different conclusion. Is that ethical? Is that possible? Uh, I think that's a very important point that you have raised. And recently there was this. Uh news article in Nature that has addressed this as well, the fake paper mills coming out of certain countries. And uh, what is important to understand with respect to these paper mills is that uh, the articles that they publish are quite similar to each other and experienced editors will be able to pick it up. They appear to have very good methodology but they somehow seem to lack heart when, the, when it comes to discussion because that actually tells you whether the persons who are writing the systematic review, they have insight about the topic in question or not. The discussion part is quite critical for that. So that's something that editors can use to distinguish fake paper mill systematic reviews from genuine ones. And of course, it's not ethical to use these paper mills for conducting systematic reviews and publishing systematic reviews, particularly redundant reviews. Uh, with respect to updating of reviews, very many systematic reviews may actually be updated at regular intervals. But there needs to be a significant body of evidence that has actually emerged before a systematic review is updated. That significant body of evidence may simply be one major clinical trial but it should be significant enough. But generally it is a few studies that have come after that and whether they have actually 
changed the equipoise with respect to the clinical question that was posed and whether combining them together with the previous evidence may generate a better evidence to guide clinical decision making if that is the case then one can definitely repeat systematic reviews but there must be adequate justification for that or if previous systematic reviews conducted by another group of authors have significant methodological issues then also it provides enough grounds to conduct another systematic review but the authors conducting the second systematic review should have their own search own identification of articles rather than relying on those articles simply identified in the previous search unless it was their own search and they want to update it with some relevant important information so again these are subjective things and there is no black and white but definitely uh, fake paper mills generating systematic reviews that is not ethical i think that is clear okay thank you so you have also raised another point if a systematic review ends up with just one or two studies for analysis it means that something wrong with aims of that systematic review we as editors should be also very careful with this type of systematic reviews and reject if we see uh, thousands of uh, sources analyzed and only one or two clinical trials are uh, left for qualitative or quantitative systematic reviews of course Quantitative systematic reviews are senseless if there are only one or two uh, clinical trials or cohort studies. So your uh, talk is uh, very uh, useful for uh, those who are going to write systematic reviews and they should, authors of systematic reviews should know about updates in this field. And you mentioned about Prisma S standard. So you emphasized importance of uh, comprehensive and systematic searches. Thank you for referring to my guidelines, 2011 guidelines. And I hope that today's participants, novice uh, authors, PhD candidates will use that uh, guidance for writing not just not, uh, narrative reviews because even narrative reviews need also search strategy, comprehensive search strategy even hypothesis, scientific hypothesis. These type of articles also need evidence-based search strategy and rational point. So thank you very much, Durga. I thank hope uh, there will be comments, questions, and always thank you for your professional stance, for your uh, support and uh, attendance of, I know that you are very busy with your COVID-19 clinics and many other family and other uh, problems, but thank you for uh, sparing some time for attending this. Uh, dear Durga, one more thank question you. from our PhD students. Uh, which uh, easy to read books, yes, for beginners, uh, would you recommend uh, regarding to uh, statistics, yes, analysis? Uh, Regarding statistical analysis, yes, yes, is that yes. the question? Yes. Uh, there is a book called as uh, Kirkwood and Stern, Essential Medical Statistics, second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's a very good textbook for uh, understanding basic statistics. Uh, could you write uh, in uh, chat? Uh, could you type uh, yes, the yes, name yes. of this book in the chat? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'll do that. Okay, well, uh, Durga is writing. We know there are several experts in the field of statistics. Farouk Habibzadeh from Iran is the one of the best experts. Durga himself also knows a lot about biostatistics. And today we also have uh, Dr. Gutar from Lviv, who is also editor, statistical editor, and I'm sure he may uh, also support PhD candidates in uh, Ukraine. And any scientific journal uh, attempting to, uh, in, uh, to uh, trying to index the journal by Scopus and Medline, they also should have statistical editor and they should correct uh, statistical mistakes in their uh, journals. Uh, some journals, good journals have statistical reviewers, but 
It's not so popular in Eastern Europe, I mean in Ukraine, uh, simply authors uh, publish something and then statistical, uh, statistical mistakes surface. So it's better to have uh, both statistical reviewers for original research papers, systematic reviews, and statistical editors who may correct, may find uh, errors, statistical errors, and may also initiate retraction. So over to you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have discussed uh, all main items of today's agenda. Uh, who would like to add something <laughs> before we finish uh, our participants? Uh, we are waiting for your comments. <laughs> uh, Professor Zaichkivska, Oksana, would you like to... Uh... Yes, I can join <laughs> the conversation. It was very nice to see all... Uh... But we are uh, oh, the we... participants. Unfortunately, I cannot switch oh, uh, okay. on video because it will be uh, worse connection. Uh, so thank you very much uh, again, uh, uh, our lectures. Uh, special big sense, Armen, who established so uh, nice um, um, group of uh, lectures. Very nice to see Professor. Uh, because it was very nice to visit uh, Zagreb University Medical Faculty uh, lab uh, where is Professor Srechko is head. Of course, we knew uh, this uh, great Croatian medical uh, journal and we are very happy uh, to have uh, so nice friends uh, in editorial board now. So, uh, Professor Srechko we, we have good uh, news that our journal also get notification in the Scopus uh, base. So, I am talking about the medical science. Yes, so now we are working hard to collect uh, good uh, reviewers, uh, good uh, um, authors. I really believe that. Uh, journal is a treasure. I like your definition that a good journal is a treasure for the nation. And so oh, I do hope that uh, our journal will be a platform how to learn to be uh, and uh, prepare uh, to be good writer and to how to prepare good um, paper manuscript. We I'm very happy to co work with uh, Dr. Zimba, because uh, she, she is my assistant and sector editors, and so we have a lot of work. Now, when is number of uh, manuscripts submitted uh, increased in several times, so several times, but unfortunately, we cannot find diamonds. So thank you again for all participants. It was very nice to see you, and I hope we will cooperate. Uh, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all our speakers, uh, to all our participants, uh, to um, Shevchenko Scientific Society, Danilo Halitsky, Lviv National Medical University uh, for organizing uh, this uh, meeting, and also uh, to Ukrainian Council of Science Editor uh, that was launched <laughs> uh, one month ago. And now we are working uh, on um, uh, our website development, yes. <laughs> Olena, so today we have uh, some uh, experts who can be invited as honorary lifetime members of Ukrainian <laughs> Council of Science Editors. And I am sure after the, uh, or even before end of pandemic, some of our colleagues, uh, lecturers may visit Lviv, Lviv <laughs> National Medical University. We have Srechko Gajovic, we have uh, Durga Misra, Latika Gupta, uh, Tsvetoslav Georgiev from Bulgaria. Yes. So we have a powerful group of experts in different fields of science, and they can uh, represent the, their countries as international members of uh, Ukrainian Council of Science Editors. Unfortunately, Professor Stoika, uh, who is uh, president of our Ukrainian Council of Science He's Editor, now, yeah. uh, now is okay. reading a lecture. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's okay. Yes. But uh, I, I am sure he also uh, will uh, 
uh, okay that uh, initiative to invite in international experts to join yes, uh, as course. honorary <laughs> lap, lifetime um, lifetime members and again uh, it's an opportunity to launch new journal published in english meeting all uh, ethical standards and aiming to uh, get indexed by scopus web of science and archived by pubmed central uh, today's meeting uh, uh, is important uh, because we discuss uh, issues of ethical publishing, avoiding pseudoscientific papers, uh, pub pub writing and publishing papers uh, in line with um, standards, different standards, protocols uh, for preparation, search strategies, uh, uh, and also reporting standards. All these points are important to publish good articles in local or international journals. For local journals, it's important because they need to apply to Medline with, a, with a numerous evidence-based articles. For PubMed Central, you probably know that we have Central Asian Journal of uh, hypothe Medical Hypothesis and Ethics, and we are going to collect 25 evidence-based scientific articles, narrative reviews, systematic reviews, and then uh, apply to PubMed Central for uh, archiving. So hopefully Ukrainian journals will also switch to English, try to find agents capable of converting their uh, articles uh, to um, JATS XML, format acceptable for PubMed Central, and also target Medline. For Medline, they simply need uh, acceptable uh, XML format for uh, me metadata. Thank you for, uh, to all our lecturers, participants. Thank you, thank you uh, to representatives of Bulgaria, Croatia, uh, Ukraine, India, uh, and Kazakhstan. Yeah. Yes, they, we have they... really international meeting. <laughs> Uh, dear colleagues, we hope that knowledge uh, gained during today's meeting uh, will transform into advanced academic activities and uh, really great uh, articles uh, published in great uh, journals. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, hope see you soon. <laughs> Have a good evening. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.